Keelan, can you please call the roll? Good morning. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. The mayor should be joining us a little bit later. He was pulled away for something, and I'm the presiding officer until he arrives. So uh, let's see. Next, we will have hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Mayor. Welcome to Portland City Council. To testify before council, in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a di disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will res result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest or trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you, Lindley. First up is communications. Keelan, can you please call the first item 247 and the first individual? Request of Aubrey Russell to address council regarding Lincoln and Roosevelt statues in the South Park blocks. Uh, they let us know they're canceling their request. Okay. Let's go on to 248. Request of Tyler F. to address council regarding recent changes made to Portland Street response procedure. Good morning. Renee, I want to start by congratulating you on somehow being a more reprehensible politician than the milquetoast mayor himself. Before you even took office, your campaign was caught up in a rent scandal with Jordan Schnitzer that rivaled that of Tevis paying his own mayoral campaign $150,000. Shortly after taking office, you retweeted pa Patriot Prayer member Quincy Franklin, making it clear whose interests you work for. Speaking of social media, you've already shown a pattern of using your platforms to spread misinformation like when you incorrectly conflated gun violence hotspots with homeless encampments on Instagram. Or on March 31st, this past Friday, when you tweeted a graphic from the budget office and declared without context that the city had spent over $1.7 billion on homelessness since 2015. Just gonna do the math for you, Renee. That works out to roughly 243 million per year for eight years, which is barely 4% of the city's $5.4 billion annual budget. In February, Renee, you banned the distribution of tents by Portland Street Response just days before 10 inches of snow fell across the metro area. By PSR's own metrics, the team handed out 473 tents over a six month period last year. You yourself have even acknowledged that preventing PSR from giving out tents will do next to nothing to stop tent distribution as the majority of tents come from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. This means your efforts are performative at best and just plain cruel at worst. The union that represents PSR recently put out a statement denouncing your actions. A portion of that statement reads, the topic of how to best help the unhoused population is complex and will not be solved overnight. It requires building relationships and trust with our neighbors who have been historically marginalized and disenfranchised and listening to their lived experiences to find a solution. It also requires increased access to social services, including rehab, detox, and supportive housing all of which are extremely limited in the Portland metro area. Our unhoused neighbors are struggling to survive. Therefore, we as Portland Street Response employees must not be prohibited from providing simple resources like tents and tarps that could literally save someone's life. Renee, you're over here banning tents without providing alternatives to shelter while the city has a shortage of an estimated 3,000 beds for unhoused Portlanders, while other commissioners later this morning are looking to amend the Bureau of Development Services to make it easier for developers to break ground on affordable housing. This city needs solutions, not sound bites. Your neoliberal policies are as stale as Reagan's corpse and we are tired of inflammatory and inaccurate comments that only serve to rile up your NIMBY base. Stop fear mongering, Renee, and start working to address the systemic causes of the crisis we're all living in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tyler, for testifying. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, you wanted to say something? Well, Tyler, thanks so much for the comments. Uh, I want to emphasize a couple of pieces. Um, 
When we issued the moratorium on tent distribution, it was after extensive consultation with the fire marshal and the fire chief. We listened to frontline uh, workers who are confronting this issue every single day. Uh, at that time, over 40% of our fire deaths, over 40% of our fire responses, and over 40% of our fire injuries were in the homeless community, less than 1% of our population. Needless to say, this is overwhelming our first responders. At the same time, the city of Sport Portland spends between 10 and 20 million each year in cleaning up homeless camps. It was irresponsible for Portland Street Response to be distributing tents, and it will not happen under my watch. We have to end the cycle of enablement. We have to address the underlying crisis on our streets with addiction service, mental illness services, shelter, and long-term housing. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Let's go to 249. Request of Jared Lors to address council regarding road improvement to build communities. Hello, I've had a little bit of audio issues. Are you hearing me? Yep. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to highlight something that I've done in my neighborhood. Um, basically, the neighbors got together and we're considered unincorporated Portland. So as you get to my street, which is Marigold, you'll get to the very bottom, which is the primary entrance to Woods Park, where the city has been many years ago that this is no incorporated Portland, it is unincorporated. So we've received zero services. Um, a little bit of history, my family built this house back in 1986. I'm now there taking care of Jared, we lost your audio. Sorry, I'm having to play with my audio here. We and can hear you again, Jared, please go. In all the years of living there, we have had the road graveled one time. The property taxes at this house have now skyrocketed to $7,500 a year, and we're receiving almost zero services from the city. Um, again, we, we paved this road, and I'm very happy we came at great expense to me. You know, it came out of my pocket. It was not tax funded. Um, but, you know, I get the joy out of seeing my neighbors actually forming a stronger community. What well, as they. Yeah. We, we lost, we lost your volume again. Maybe if you take your camera off, Jared. We can't hear you, Jared. Jared can't hear me. Jared. Jared, we, we couldn't this? hear we couldn't hear you the last 30 seconds. No worries. Um, basically, what I'm trying to highlight is that I think we really need to get back to basics of roads being paved. I've seen the community flourish now that we've paved, the, paved this road on my street at expense of myself and my neighbors. You know, sometimes we talk about building community in different ways. I think that the most basic is making sure people can walk through the neighborhood, they can meet their neighbors, they can talk to them, and they're not tripping over gravel, you know, hitting potholes constantly. Um, the, the Capitol Highway project is being completed right now, but every street attached to it is completely damaged and in very poor repair. So that's just what I'm trying to highlight is that from my experience, which I paid for out of my own pocket, as well as my neighbors, that when you build roads and streets, rather than focusing on a lot of the minutiae, we tend to do so, we get really good results. So I apologize for my audio issues. I, I hope that, you know, my message gets across that I feel we just need to get back to basics. Let's go back to roads, streets, sidewalks, livability, and stop focusing on some of these other things that seem to be distractions. Thank you, Jared. And you got to the heart of the matter, and thank you for your testimony. Commissioner Maps. Uh, hey, Jared. Uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, um, I'm the guy who's in charge of PBOT. Uh, so, uh, I, I appreciate hearing your concerns. I'll, I'll tell you the truth, your audio cut in and out enough. I'm not quite sure I have a full handle on uh, um, the particular issue you're trying to uh, uh, um, dig into. But if you give your contact information to the clerk, I will have someone from my office uh, reach out to you and uh, we can continue this dialogue. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Maps. Thank you. Jared, uh, onward to 250. Request of Fernando Buenrostro Rostro to address council regarding civil service board appointees. Fernando Hello, was, Fernando. Fernando was gonna join us in person. Oh, great. Oh. Oh, I don't think they're here. Okay. All right, let's go to the next item, 251. Request of Crystal Otero to address council regarding concerns with Urban Alchemy website. 
Thank you. Welcome, Crystal. You'll have three minutes and the mic's on. And it should pick you up where it's located. <clears throat> My name is Crystal Otero and I'm a resident of Portland in the Brooklyn neighborhood. For most of my professional career, I have worked with people experiencing chronic homelessness. I hold an MSW from the PSU School of Social Work. Today I'm here representing myself. Given everything that I have learned about serving people experiencing homelessness, I am confused and concerned by a prominently displayed so slogan on Urban Alchemy's website. I have included a printed screenshot of the slogan in materials I shared today with council members and the mayor. The slogan is visible on Urban Alchemy's official website, located at the bottom of their webpage. For context, the slogan I am describing contains the F word. For this reason, I will not state it here. Briefly, a slogan is an image or phrase that is now used to build a brand. And over the last 500 years, it has been used to mobilize people and to indicate a private or double meaning. Slogans have power. And there are several used within the movement to decriminalize homelessness that have inspired me, including house keys, not handcuffs, and nothing about us without us. The slogan being used by Urban Alchemy seems to signal a disgust for something. What that is is not immediately clear to me, and I have never observed that type of slogan in promotional materials for a social service agency. I find Urban Alchemy's use of this slogan to indicate duplicity. What are their intentions? And by extension, what are the intentions of those that have chosen them to be a vendor in Portland? Beyond the slogan, I am observing an obsession with cleaning the streets. And while I can understand the desire to have a beautiful city, I am worried that this is leading to the humiliation and degradation of people experiencing poverty. I acknowledge the extreme pressure that our city staff and our nonprofit service providers are under to decrease visible homelessness. Our challenge is the number one cause of homelessness, pervasive and lifelong poverty. There are innumerable ways to support people experiencing homelessness in our city. We can do better than sanctioned parking lots and we must ensure all of our vendors hold compassionate and clearly stated values. As the saying goes, nothing about us without us. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go on to the next item. Um, thank you for your testimony. Since we have a little bit of time before our time certain, let's go to the consent agenda. Uh, we've had two items pulled. Okay, items and those are? 257 and 258. Okay, we'll do those at the end of the agenda. Okay. Okay, colleagues, I'll go ahead and read the item for consent. Do we read consent? Oh, yeah, actually, we just need to call for the vote. <laughs> That's what I thought. All right, call the roll. And Ryan, it's a new thanks. order. Yeah. Ryan. Oh, sorry, wait a minute. Let me, um, I need to do the order different since you're the presiding oh, yeah. officer. Thank you. Uh, Gonzalez. I'm sorry, agenda. we're on consent agenda? Yeah. yeah. And two two items were pulled. 257 and 258 were pulled? Yes. But 264 is, oh, 264 is on regular agenda, sorry. I'm clarifying here. I'm an I. Okay. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay. Now we can go to the first time certain item because it is 945, correct? Yes. Okay. Item 252. Proclaim April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month. Colleagues, I will hand this off to Commissioner Rubio to introduce this item. Commissioner Rubio, take it away. 
Thank you, Council President. Um, I am honored to gather us here this, this morning to acknowledge uh, fair housing and its significance, both historically and within the context of the housing crisis we are facing today. The Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968 as a tool to address the injustices and oppression that were embedded in our society through, the hous through housing discrimination and differential treatment. The government, industry, and society were all complicit in creating intentional policies and actions that excluded communities of color and, in particular, black Americans from opportunities to access and maintain safe housing in entire neighborhoods. This included establishing racial exclusion and covenants on properties, preventing access to mortgages, industry standards of not showing or selling particular properties, um, and refusal to rent and renting with predatory terms. With the passage of the Fair Housing Act, discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, or religion was prohibited. Uh, these protections have since expanded to include sex, disability, and familial status. And despite the passage of this act, and despite declaring April to be Fair Housing Month, we know that the impacts of systemic discrimination and exclusion have still continued to affect our communities for generations. The data continues to show higher cost burdens, higher risks of displacement, and differential treatment for certain communities within our city. And we know that neighborhoods facing higher rates of eviction are the same neighborhoods that our communities of color historically reside in. Portland must continue in our duty to affirmatively further fair housing, to remove barriers to housing, and to create vibrant and accessible communities and ensure all Portlanders have opportunity. So now I will turn it over to Housing Bureau Interim Director Rogers and Fair Housing Council of Oregon Director Alan Lazo for presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioner. Oh, Commissioners. Um, Kaylin, can you pull up our slides? Great. I'm Molly Rogers. I'm the Interim Director of the Housing Bureau. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm joined here today by Brian D. Decker the manager of the Rental Services Office, as well as Alan Lazo, the executive director of the Fair Housing Council. I just would like to start by thanking Commissioner Rubio for reminding us of the history of housing discrimination in our nation and in our own community, and acknowledging the role that government and policy played in excluding individuals, families, and communities from housing. I'm gonna turn it over to Brian now. Next slide. Good morning. When we discuss fair housing, it is clear that action is needed because it was intentional actions of society that created segregation and disparity. And as a result, only intentional actions to dismantle these systems and address these perpetual injustices have the power to succeed. Next slide, please. As you've heard from the State of Housing Report of 2022, one in every two renter households have a household income of roughly 60% AMI or below and one in every four renter households are paying more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Next slide, please. When we look at these housing challenges through a racial lens, we know that white Portlanders earn nearly 220% more than black Portlanders. And unsurprisingly, white homeownership rates are 26 percentage points higher than for black Portlanders. To pay the same portion of income on housing as their white counterparts, Black Portlanders would need housing with rents and home prices 53% lower than current rates. While this data is troubling and often overwhelming to hear, Portland must continue our commitment to fair housing and addressing these persistent inequities. Turn it back over to Molly. Next slide, please. The Portland Housing Bureau has continued to invest in affordable housing development in strategic areas of our city where we know that there is high risk of displacement we partnered with, just for an example, partnered with Home Forward and the Urban League recently to open the Hattie Redmond, which is a 60-unit building with entirely permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless individuals in the Kenton neighborhood with a goal of reconnecting displaced residents into the Albina community. The project is named in honor of a local black civil rights leader, Harriet Redmond, also want to recognize that Commissioner Gonzalez got to join us in the celebration yesterday. Uh, it was quite, uh, quite the energetic opening um, with lots of um, 
uh, lots of incredible speakers. Um, in addition to these larger projects, we continue to support fair housing audit testing, fair housing enforcement, and fair housing education through our rental services office. And we have shifted our approach and understanding of what it can mean to work with community through initiatives like the Cully Tax Increment Financing District, a co-created vision between government and community to support more affordable housing, thriving black, indigenous, and people of color owned businesses, parks, and neighbor and programs that reflect the diversity of the Cully neighborhood. Next slide, please. I'm just going to take a moment and just read this slide since of its significance. Fair Housing Month is for celebration and proclamation and a reminder that we have more work to do and to take action to address a debt owed and promises made. Next slide. Alan? Thank you, uh, Interim Director Rogers and, and Brian. Um, uh, Commissioner Ryan, Commissioners, for the record, I'm Alan Lazo. I'm the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. The Fair Housing Council of Oregon is a private, nonprofit civil rights organization whose mission is to end housing discrimination and ensure equal access to housing opportunity for everyone in Oregon. Happy Fair Housing Month. For folks who have seen me here before, uh, you know that I get to say that this is my favorite day at City Council. Um, and so I'm here to bring you three things this morning. Um, to recognize, acknowledge, and celebrate. As um, our friends from the, and partners from the Housing Bureau talked about, uh, we need to recognize that we are celebrating this year the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. The work that we do stands on the shoulders of a giant national movement that is rooted significantly in the work that doc, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did 55 years ago in the open housing movement. I think also when we're in this room here, um, I, I always have to acknowledge the work of our um, late colleague, Commissioner Nick Fish, uh, and the work that his father did to significantly move forward the Fair Housing Act in 1988. So we really recognize the work that came before in the movement and the work that moves us forward. We also must acknowledge that the housing affordability crisis, as we've heard so poignantly this morning, impacts every community in our state and every person in every community. And we know that when we have a housing affordability crisis, what we also have is a housing opportunity crisis. As I've talked about in this room before, housing is not only about the roof over our heads and the walls around us, but the opportunity out that front door. And that's why it's so important for us in this moment to pause and really work towards celebrating the work that has been done and reaffirming our commitment to the work that's ahead of us. So here I am to celebrate this morning the city's commitment and partnership to the work that we all are doing together around fair housing and ensuring equal access to housing opportunity. You heard um, Interim Director Rogers talk about the efforts that the city is making and we are really grateful to be partners with all of you. We know also, if, for folks who have been paying attention in the middle of the legislative session, there are really significant efforts statewide that will also help to move the work forward in a community like Portland. Also, we know that right now the um, federal government has uh, published proposed rules, and I'm so glad that Commissioner Rubio um, brought the words affirmatively furthering fair housing. I wasn't going to use those words, but since you so graciously got through them, I'll also try. Um, but there are proposed rules around affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is an important concept in the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that, that proactively asks communities to ensure there's equal housing opportunity for everyone. We know that housing opportunity has impacted certain communities and the root of the Fair Housing Act is to really move those opportunities forward. So as a way of celebrating today, what makes today so wonderful and, um, in the best day at City Council is our opportunity to bring to you the Fair Housing Month contest, uh, poster contest awards. And so without further ado, I am gonna go through and um, I think we can move to some of the slides. And there are actually a, co a couple of young artists that are with us here this morning. If, and if I could, I'll ask them to come up uh, here with me. Yeah, you get to come up here and show us your art, right? Thank you for making room. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I will uh, introduce you as we move through the slides. 
So um, this year, the theme for our poster contest was community includes all of us. And, and I think that um, it is always so delightful and engaging to see the vision that young artists like this bring forward to us every year. So with that, here is, the, um, and, and so these are just a few of the folks who are award winners from the Portland area. So we've included in this, um, this is a, uh, the second place poster award for the grades one through three category. And this is um, Hajar Abadar from the Muslim Educational Trust. If you can go to the next slide. And so this is actually the poster from Rania Ahmed, who is right here next to me. You are a uh, second grader now at, um, at Muslim Educational Trust, eight years old. This was our first place award for the grades one through three category. Um, Rania said that um, she was, uh, thought it was really important to enter the contest and really um, talk about how important fair housing is and that she really also enjoyed coloring and that the, what she is conveying here are um, kids of very different, uh, lots of different types that are holding hands and being in community together. So thank you so much for the work that you did on this uh, beautiful poster, Rania. Um, she also said that her favorite subject in school is reading and drawing and art. Um, she also likes to uh, mini cook, which I'm not sure exactly what that is, but you can tell me, I'm not a, a huge mini cook fan, but um, uh, just regular size cooking for me. <laughs> she also likes to bike and uh, do gymnastics. So Rania, thank you so much for being here with us this morning and thank you for the beautiful uh, poster that you drew. Uh, next slide, please. This is the um, second place award winner from, for grades fourth and fifth. Uh, this was Haroon Jamal, from the, also from the Muslim Educational Trust. We had a number of really excellent entries uh, from, from the Muslim Educational Trust, and I recognize that their facility is actually outside the city of Portland and Tiger, but um, they are uh, a group that serves communities throughout the city, and so we are, we are really delighted to have their presence. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. This is the first place award winner from grades four through fifth, and this is uh, another entrant from the Muslim Educational Trust, Sidra El Moseli. Um, okay, go ahead and go to the next one. And this is actually the third place uh, winner from grades six through eight, and this is actually the poster that was drawn by June Offman. Did I say your name right, June? Um, Offman. Offman, thank you. Uh, from the Ivy School. So June is in the seventh grade, age 12. Um, she uh, entered the contest because it was important for her to make art with meaning that can represent issues with the world and help spread awareness about the necessary changes. She is also um, enjoys English in school and listening to music and experimenting with new recipes, reading, writing, illustrating comics and short stories. So thank you, June, so much for your beautiful poster and for being with us here this morning. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, it's just, um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, it, it's really important to me to make art, um, not only that's like um, pretty, but <laughs> that also has like meaning um, and that can spread awareness about different issues. And I really enjoy to make like meaningful art. So thank you, I really appreciate you having me here. Thank you for joining us. And I see it got cut off a little bit at the, at the bottom, but um, for those of us of a certain age, we may not recognize that there's like a social media connection at the bottom there too. So very, very, very nice. And then the next one I think is gonna be on the next slide. Uh, this is a, another entrance from the Muslim Educational Trust. This is the first place in the grade six through eight category. That's a really beautiful poster also from Huda Ibrahim. So I'll take a moment to Look at that. I like that, that um, all of them have people in them, and then some of these also have um, different types of um, dwellings and homes. All right, next slide. And that brings us to our grand prize award winner for this year's poster contest, the theme around community 
includes all of us. This is from Halima Assad at the Muslim Educational Trust. Halima could not be here with us this morning, but she is a seventh grader at the Muslim Educational Trust. She also echoed, echoed I think, much of what June said about entering the contest. Um, she said that she always had loved to color and draw. So using those skills that she has, drawing something that supported such an extreme cause was something that she knew she had to do. She said, even if I didn't win, I knew that what I illustrated meant something, whether it was in my heart or shown to the public. She said she didn't have a favorite subject, uh, but loves to write uh, in her, and writes in her free time and in class, and um, that writing, in addition to the art that she does, can send a powerful message. So she said that her, her um, favorite subject in school was language arts. So we have some of these uh, posters. These uh, Halima's poster will be printed and distributed throughout the state. We've got some here that are available for you all to hang in your offices, and then we'll send some over to our partners at the Portland Housing Bureau. Uh, you know, again, in conclusion, you know, it is really important for us to take this moment to celebrate and really thank the folks, uh, all the different partners we have, including, I want to make sure I thank the, uh, the staff at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. Uh, I think one of my staff members, or our, our team members is here today. You know, he in the back there, thank you. Um, and with that, really, also, you know, it is important for us to recognize, <laughs> I turned my own mic off, um, recognize that, that that we have to take this moment to recommit to this promise around fair housing uh, and to ensure that, that as we move forward in our, our work, that we are fulfilling our promise to these young artists, that we are working to create the world that they have envisioned for us so artfully and beautifully in these posters. So that's the promise that I um, leave you with this morning, and we are um, delighted to be here, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, before we read the proclamation, why don't we hear from some of our colleagues? I think they have some remarks. Uh, Commissioner Matt. Can I, can I finish out his presentation? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought your presentation was done. Oh, yeah, his is, is done. Okay. I just wanted to finish out by saying thank you to Alan and Brian and Director Rogers for, um, for your comments and your presentation this morning. Um, more than ever, this work is important to lift up during this really critical time. And Alan, you've been here every year. It's an important reminder more, more than ever. Commissioner Mapp, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer Ryan, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio and the Mayor for sponsoring today's proclamation. I want to begin by uh, thanking our panel for today's presentation, and in particular, I want to recognize and thank Rania and June for sh being here today and sharing your art. Uh, you are very talented uh, young women with uh, bright futures ahead. I hope this is not the last time we see you in this council. Um, and I also want to say this. I'm delighted to join this council in declaring April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month here in Portland, Oregon. As we have learned today, Fair Housing Month commemorates the Federal Fair Housing Act, which was signed on April 11th, 1968. Now, that was just two days after Martin Luther King was buried, and the fact that those two events happened in close proximity um, is not an accident. The Federal Fair Housing Act uh, made it illegal to discriminate in housing based on race, color, national origin, or religion. We mark Fair Housing Month because housing discrimination continues to run rampant even here in Portland. For example, the Fair Housing Council of Oregon found that between January 2018 and June 2019, there was evidence of discriminatory practices in 48% of the Portland real estate transactions they studied. Obviously, that is unacceptable. And that's why during Fair Housing Month, 
Portlanders recommit ourselves to the principle of fair housing for all. Now, if you are a Portlander who has experienced housing discrimination, I encourage you to visit the website for the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. They can connect you to uh, housing resources and educate you about your rights. Colleagues, for these reasons and more, I am delighted to join you in declaring April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month here in Portland, Oregon. Thank you, Presiding Officer Ryan. Yeah, I was waiting for you to get to your seat. <laughs> I just want to thank June and Raina for your beautiful art. Thanks so much for coming down to City Hall today. I hope to see you again and look forward to your future beautiful artwork. So thank you so much. Yeah, Alan, it's great to see you in person. Um, and your favorite day becomes all of our favorite days, especially when you bring children with art. Uh, Rania, thank you so much for being here. Your art's really pretty. I liked it a lot. And thank you to the parents. I assume those are your parents. <laughs> Guardians, yeah, wave. Thank you for all the support you provide in, in bringing your child here this morning. And also to June. June, thanks for being here. It's wonderful to see your artwork as well. And um, I'm happy to see that Ivy and, and the Muslim Education Trust is so engaged with, with the work. Uh, I think uh, everything has really been covered. I think that um, it's all about generating intergenerational wealth. And the only way to really do that is entrepreneurship and businesses and uh, owning homes. And so I think that we have to continue to give this a laser focus. I think continuing to do an overlay with economics and race is really important because there's just so many people that um, unfortunately can't not only buy a home in Portland, but throughout our state. So thank you for being a statewide laser focus and giving the city of Portland um, attention with the great partnership with Interim Director Molly Rogers and the Housing Bureau. So I will now um, turn this over back over to you, Commissioner Rubio. Can you please read the proclamation? Thank you. Um, okay, so I will start. Um, whereas the Fair Housing <coughs> Act enacted on April 11, 1968 was adopted to prohibit discriminatory housing practices, undo racial segregation patterns, and provide equal access to housing opportunity for all, and whereas in Portland, the combined federal, state, and local civil rights laws protect people from housing discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, gender, familial status, disability, marital status, sexual orientation, source of income, military status, gender identity, ethnicity, or history of domestic violence, stalking, or sexual assaults, and whereas decades of intentional and unintentional government action combined with enduring systemic inequalities have created a need for displacement prevention and mitigation policies. And whereas this year, Portland continues to invest in, a, in an affordable, safe housing for impacted communities and has continued to push for fair housing enforcement, education, and testing. And whereas despite existing fair housing protections and strategies, Portland residents and historically disenfranchised communities continue to face barriers and access to housing and patterns of disenfranchisement continue. And whereas Fair Housing Month is an opportunity to reflect on our pro progress and to acknowledge the remaining challenges we have yet to overcome. And whereas we celebrate the passage of the Fair Housing Act, let us recommit ourselves to eliminating discrimination in housing by dismantling the barriers to housing choice, acknowledging the intersection of health economic and housing inequalities, inequities, dedicating resources to meaningfully address disparities, adopting policies that support our community's most vulnerable residents, and creating more housing that welcomes and celebrates people of all abilities, races, cultures, and incomes. Now, therefore, on behalf of Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, City of Roses, I do hereby proclaim April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month in Portland, and we encourage all residents to observe this month by joining the citywide effort to realize equal housing opportunity for all. Yay. Alan, you said it was a celebration, right? Yes. Right. So, so your <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Bye, right. Rania. Bye, June. Okay, let's go to item 253. Thank you. Proclaim April 2023 to be Parkinson's Awareness Month. 
Thank you, Keelan. Our next item is a proclamation acknowledging April 2023 as Parkinson's Awareness Month. I will now turn it over to our two presenters. It says over Zoom, but you're here in person. Good to see you. Is your name Kevin? Yes. All right, Kevin, um, welcome. You're the Public Policy Ambassador with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and a facilitator with the Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. I also have in my notes that Megan Tay, are they on Zoom? Megan will be joining us by um, Zoom today. She couldn't make it in person. Okay, until. so she'll got, be on Zoom. Yeah, she got sick, so she'll okay, be joining and there's us Megan. on Zoom. Hi, Megan. Um, she is also a public policy ambassador with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Welcome, Kevin and Megan. It's good to have you here today. Please take it away. Um, I wanted to thank um, Mayor and, and City Commissioners for proclaiming April as Parkinson's Awareness Month. Um, this means a lot to me, uh, the person with Parkinson's. My name is Kevin Mansfield. Um, please excuse me if I lose my train of thought. This disease happens, so I just forewarn everybody. Um, I, live, I live here in Portland. Um, I've been a public policy ambassador with Michael J. Fox Foundation now for about 10 years. I've been a facilitator with Parkinson's Resources of Oregon for about the last 21 years and I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in year 2001. I'd like to give you a little story about um, my experience with Parkinson's. Um, when, when I was first diagnosed in 2001, my neurologist told me that I have Parkinson's, come back and see me in six months. That was it, put me out of the workforce. So not knowing anything about it, I went home and I did the bad thing and looked online. And I, I got super depressed and um, uh, more upset because all it told you, told you about on there was about the advanced stages of Parkinson's. I finally found Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. They were very kind and helpful. They talked to me on the phone for about two hours and calmed me down and eventually um, invited me to join a support group, which I said yes to. Tell you how much pro Parkinson's is progressing. When I was diagnosed in 2001, there was approximately 14 to 16 support groups in the state of Oregon and Southwest Washington. Here we are 20 years later, we have approximately 50 plus support groups with Parkinson's. It's an ever growing disease. Um, usually you found Parkinson's in people that was in their 60s, 70s and 80s. That doesn't pertain anymore. It doesn't matter how old people are. I was diagnosed in my mid 40s and it put me out of the workforce. Um, when, before the pandemic, I was able, we went to Washington DC for a, a four day uh, uh, symposium. We spent one day up on Capitol Hill. When I was up on Capitol Hill, I met two women that was 32 years old, having their first child, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I met a gentleman that was 22 years old diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, a couple of years um, ago, I was at a um, health fair uh, representing Parkinson's Resources of Oregon at that day. And I had an older gentleman come up to me and we were talking about Parkinson's and he started going, having tears come down his face. And I asked him what was wrong. Was there something I said to upset him or you know what I could do to help him out? And he said, no, that, that Unfortunately, a very rare case, this is eight year old grandchild was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So it doesn't matter how old we are or what sex we are, anybody um, can have this disease. We thought that there was a pro there's approximately a million people plus in the United States that have Parkinson's. We thought that it was growing at a rate of 50,000 people per year we found out that at the end of um, December or mid-December mid of 2022, the study was put off by the Parkinson's Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, as well as the Civil um, Evol Evolution Services, came up and said that we are now 50% higher than previous estimates. Now they're predicting that there's 90,000 people a year coming down with being diagnosed with Parkinson's. 
we think that there's an average between 14 and 22,000 people, or 20,000 people here in the state of Oregon with Parkinson's. So this is an ever-growing um, disease. There are several um, support groups in the Portland metro area that have Parkinson's. Uh, most of them still because of the pandemic and stuff are virtual. Um, there's one also at the, um, the VA ha has a support group and Providence Medical Center has a support group. I encourage you guys to, if you have time, to go to a support group or connect with somebody. I have a support group that meets on the second Tuesday of the month at two o'clock in the afternoon. I have a hybrid meeting. So if you let me know in advance, I'll send you a connection to that and you're happy to join us because I have in-person and, and um, Zoom people joining us. Um, that's my part. I'll turn it over to Megan, but I do want to thank you. Thank you. This is, is a very Im Im important thing for, for us. Thank you so much, Kevin. And Megan, we can see you and uh, go ahead and begin your, t your, your testimony. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Megan Tai. I'm here as both as an advocate a patient advocate with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and as someone with young onset Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a disorder of the central nervous system that affects movement. For unknown reasons, brain cells that make chemical, a chemical called dopamine, die. This leaves the brain without enough dopamine, which is a chemical that coordinates movement and that causes unintended or uncontrollable movements, such as shaking, stiffness, and difficulty with balance and coordination. It can also cause mental and behavioral changes, sleep problems, depression, anxiety, memory difficulties, and fatigue. Parkinson's disease is a progressive, meaning it worsens over time, disease. It develops quickly in some people, slowly in others. Parkinson's is also called a neurodegenerative disorder because it involves brain cells that die in an increasing rate. Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological disease in the world. There is no treatment to slow, stop, or reverse disease progression, nor is there a cure or a way to prevent Parkinson's. Like me, 20, 10 to 20% of Parkinson's patients are diagnosed younger than the typical 65 and older demographic. We are diagnosed in our 20s, 30s, and 40s. While our symptoms are the same as those of the older Parkinson's patients, young onset patients have a very unique journey with the disease. Far from retirement, I'm in the middle of my career. I'm also raising children and beginning to care for aging parents. Like all of you, I'm sure I have an extremely busy life, but now I also have to, um, I have about 10 medical specialists that I have to see on an either weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis just to manage this disease. I also have to follow uh, medication dosing requirements, which occur every three to four hours and have to be timed around protein intake to be effective. That's just so I can, I can function at an acceptable level and get through my day. Because of the progressive nature of this disease, I know that my symptoms will continue to worsen. However, there is no crystal ball to predict when my symptoms will take a turn for the worse. I have no way of knowing how much longer I will be able to work, care for my family, or even be independently mobile. My husband and I have to make very tough decisions about whether to save and invest every penny to prepare for possible early retirement, or splurge on travel to make memories for our kids while I'm still mobile. This disease is really difficult for me, but also extremely difficult for my family. On the day I was diagnosed, my husband became a caretaker for the rest of my life. This is, he'll do this while continuing to work, parenting our children, and bearing the emotional and financial burden of this disease. This is not the future we had been planning for each other. My children's lives are forever changed beyond what I can express to you without getting extremely emotional. Though I'm sure you can imagine the trauma a child would endure while experiencing their mom slowly transforming from an extremely active and engaging parent to eventually a shell of her former self and not being the parent they deserve. Parkinson's affects not only individuals but entire families and their communities. We need more funding for research to find a cure. Researchers currently believe Parkinson's is caused by a combination of environmental factors and genetic factors. Although I can tell you that a lot of patients, including me, do not have a family history of Parkinson's. 
We desperately need more funding to keep critical research projects moving forward as quickly as possible. As Kevin mentioned, more than a million people in the United States have Parkinson's and at least 90,000 more people are diagnosed every year. These numbers are growing at an alarming rate that requires our urgent attention. I wanna leave you with an idea of what it's like to live with Parkinson's. Imagine that you first start having trouble texting or typing, and then you notice that your writing is very tiny and illegible. You'll notice that you, wait, you can't wave goodbye with one of your hands. As the disease progresses, you'll continually drop your water bottle, be unable to open the bottle sometimes, and then when you attempt to take a sip, you'll spill. One day you'll lose your sense of smell. Another day you'll walk into a meeting and freeze in place, suddenly unable to take another step. You'll have chronic insomnia and constant pain due to muscle stiffness and cramping. As the disease continues to progress, when you wanna talk, sometimes the words won't come out. And when they do, it takes a long time to say them and your voice is slow and difficult to understand. Eventually, your voice will become so quiet that no one will be able to understand you, even if you can form words. Your gait will become stooped and labored and it just gets worse and worse until you're unable to do anything independently. Without a cure, my journey with Parkinson's will probably end when I can no longer swallow. Most people with Parkinson's typically die due to choking infections related to choking, excuse me, choke, due to choking, infections related to choking or complications from falls. This is Parkinson's and it's time to end it. For more information about how you can help to find a cure, I encourage you to visit the Michael J. Fox Foundation at michaeljfox.org. There you can learn more about Parkinson's and ways you can help either by donating your money, learning how to start a fundraiser or with your time. The Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative or PPMI is the foundation's landmark study. It gathers information over time to learn more about how brain disease starts, changes and how to stop it. We currently need people with or without Parkinson's to volunteer a few minutes of their time by completing a questionnaire online. Again, that study is called PPMI, and you can find it at michaeljfox.org. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you so much, Kevin. <clears throat> I wanna make sure I open up the floor to my colleagues, and then I'll read a proclamation at the end. Commissioner Maps. Thank you, Presiding Officer Ryan. Um, I wanna start out today by thanking Kevin and Megan for being here and sharing this presentation and sharing a little bit about their lives. And I also want to say this. I am proud to join this council in proclaiming April 2023 to be Parkinson's Awareness Month here in Portland, Oregon. Today, as we have learned, Parkinson's disease is a chronic progressive neurological disorder. The disease causes shaking, stiffness, and difficulty with balance and coordination. Symptoms tend to begin gradually and worsen over time. The community of people who have suffered from Parkinson's include familiar names like Muhammad Ali, Alan Alda, Ozzy Osbourne, Neil Diamond, Linda Ronstadt, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and of course, Michael J. Fox. In fact, more than one million people in the United States are coping with Parkinson's. And here in Oregon, more than 20,000 people live with the disease. And that number is expected to double over the next 20 years. Now, we do not yet have a cure for Parkinson's disease, but there is help and there is hope. That's why um, if you or a loved one exhibit the symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease, I encourage you to consult with your doctor and connect with a Parkinson's support group. Uh, thank you. And again, um, I, I want to thank our, our guests for being here today and sharing your stories with us. Uh, you have touched our hearts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer Ryan. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Anyone else? Just say, I just wanted to thank you know the presenters. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Megan, for sharing your really moving stories. Um, it's really important um, to learn what your experience is. I've learned a lot in your presentation today just by sharing your personal stories. 
very interested in reading more in that study, the PPMI study, so I'm gonna go look that up after council today. Um, just thank you for your courage and your advocacy. Um, I'm glad that we're lifting this up this month. I just wanna thank Kevin and Megan for your testimony and to hear the story, uh, both heart-wrenching and multifaceted, but hearing a story of another Portland parent struggling and to have a very serious uh, illness on top of that. Um, just thank you for sharing. Thank you very much yeah. for your time. I yeah. really appreciate it. I just wanted to add one little thing is that to tell you locally how much this is growing in the past nine months, I have an average of one to three people calling me being newly diagnosed, just showing you how much it's growing here in the, in the, in, in the Portland area. And now I had three people like within the last two days call me. This is just the beginning of April. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Megan. Like Commissioner Rubio, I, I learned a lot from your presentation this morning, and we'll do a proclamation. So please stay seated for just a moment. Um, and I really appreciate the, the comments by my colleagues, too. We needed to take a breath and be present with you on this topic. Um, it's just a huge impact and burden on so many Oregonians, and you don't realize it to have a presentation like this. And I want to also just say um, that 20,000 jumps out at me. That was a, that was a big number. Uh, but I also want to give you a lot of credit. Both of you, I assume you're both behind the reason why there's been a tremendous increase in the amount of support groups being offered. And I know how much that, that matters to someone that gets a diagnosis. I know in 1987 when I was told I had HIV by a doctor um, and they didn't give me any support and it was really isolating. And it's almost, uh, it's, it, 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 that almost kills you just from the um, pain of feeling so isolated. So the fact that you've focused on providing peer-to-peer -peer support is really very, very important. So thank you both for your advocacy. And I also was taken with the numbers of people that are younger that have Parkinson's. I was one of those that didn't register that. So Megan, you in particular, the, the comments you made on that point, and um, kudos to your wonderful husband for being such a great partner for you and your family. Um, I also will... Um, end this by saying I'll always have Brian Grant in my heart when I ever when I think about Parkinson's because locally he's been such a champion um, on this effort. So with that I'll go ahead and read the proclamation. Whereas Parkinson's disease affects one million people in the United States and is second most common neuro neurodegenerational degenerative that's the right way to say it disease in the United States and Parkinson's disease affects more than 20,000 people in Oregon a number that is expected to more than double by the year 2040. And it's estimated that Parkinson's cost $52 billion per year, of which the federal government shoulders $29 billion, leaving American families to cover the remaining $23 billion. And the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research is dedicated to finding a cure for Parkinson's disease through an aggressively funded research agenda and to ensuring the development of improved therapies for those living with Parkinson's today. And there are millions of Americans who are caregivers, family members, and friends of those impacted by Parkinson's disease. And it is estimated that 90,000 individuals are diagnosed annually with Parkinson's disease in North America, 50% higher than the 60,000 annual diagnosis that research previously suggested. Now, therefore, on behalf of Mayor Ted Wheeler of the City of Portland, the City of Roses, I do pro hereby proclaim April 2023 to be Parkinson's Awareness Month, and we encourage Portland and all of our residents to observe this month. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Kevin. Keelan, can you read the next item? Item 254, amend system development charge financing and exemptions code to add new deferral option for the payment of system development charges. It was 254, right? Okay, great. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. I am excited to join, let's see, I join my colleagues, Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Maps, in bringing forward this ordinance to facilitate more housing production through deferral of SDC charges in the Portland City Code. Commissioner Rubio, I will hand the mic over to you to introduce this item. Take it away. Thank you. 
Uh, colleagues, today we're taking up an item that will give housing developers an option to defer system development charges for up to 24 months. Before we start the presentation, I would like to make a motion to amend the ordinance to remove the emergency clause from item 157 in order to allow for more time for any stakeholder in inquiries or comments um, in or on the ordinance. Is that the motion then? Yes. Okay, second it? Okay. Should we now vote on that amendment? Yeah, would you like to vote on or, it or now? Do you have more to or? say? Yeah, we yeah. can vote on it now, then just. You tell oh. us what to do, Keelan. <laughs> <laughs> Gonzalez. Aye. Max. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Great, thank you, colleagues. Um, and I would also like to request uh, that this item be scheduled for a second reading on April 19, 2023. Thank you. Today's ordinance is just one action outlined in our 90-day action plan to increase housing production, make improvements on city permitting, and advance key workforce and economic development efforts. And moving this ordinance forward is a significant step in this action plan, which also includes the recent code change for office to residential conversions, the regulatory reform survey and follow-up actions, as well as our work in identifying housing needs and costs in finding available land. Through our engagement with home developers in our community, we know that the timing of system development charges is one of the biggest issues affecting the development of housing. And as I noted before, this ordinance allows for a deferral system of development charges for up to 24 months and is only applicable to projects that provide new housing units. Along with other efforts to improve process and permitting, this alone will help the flow of, of capital for housing projects and reduce the carrying costs related to each project. A decrease in carrying costs will make many housing projects more financially feasible and could spur increased investment in our housing market. Bringing this ordinance forward was a collaborative effort between bureaus, BDS, PBOT, BES, Water, and Parks. And I wanna thank all the staff that made this work happen and I'm so pleased to see our bureaus aligned um, strongly in this effort. Especially want to also thank Director Esau for her creative um, role, as a, uh, role as a creative thought partner in this, and also for the urgency and professionalism of both Director Esau and Kurt Kruger on this, um, together and with their teams to bring this work to life. So thank you to both of you. Uh, finally, I would like to extend a big appreciation to Commissioner Maps and Commissioner Ryan for their help in bringing this forward and for laying the groundwork to look at the whole permitting system nearly two years ago. So with that, I would like to invite Commissioner Maps and Commissioner Ryan to speak to this ordinance. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Colleagues, as we all know, Portland is in the grips of a housing crisis. Now, about three weeks ago, this council received the Housing Bureau's report on the state of housing in Portland for the year 2022. The take-home lesson of that report was clear. The cost of housing in Portland is too damn high. That report showed that in 2022, the average black family in Portland could not afford to buy a home in any of our city's 95 neighborhoods. In 2022, the average Latino family in Portland could not afford to buy a home in any of our city's 95 neighborhoods. And the average Native American family in Portland could not afford to buy a home in any of our city's 95 neighborhoods. Further, the average senior household in Portland could not afford to buy a home in any of our city's 95 neighborhoods. Further, the average household headed by a single mother could not afford to buy a home in any of Portland's 95 neighborhoods. And there is more bad news. The average immigrant household in Portland cannot afford to buy a home in any of Portland's 95 neighborhoods. To summarize, the average low-income family in Portland cannot afford to buy a home in Portland. The trend here is clear. Unless this council takes action on our housing crisis soon, soon Portland will be reduced to being an enclave for the wealthy. The challenge here is clear. Portland must produce more housing. The solution to Portland's housing crisis is also clear. 
Broadly speaking, this council has two tools that we can use to address this housing crisis. First, we can provide direct subsidies for the construction of new housing. Uh, subsidy, subsidizing homes for our most vulnerable neighbors is the right thing to do, and we should do more of that. However, this council should also recognize that we cannot spend our way out of this housing crisis. The magnitude of this crisis is just too large. That, unfortunately, is very, very bad news. But there is also some good news. This council has a second set of tools which we can use to stimulate home building here in Portland. Those tools are relatively cheap and they have the potential to produce more housing than we can produce through subsidies. This second set of tools at our disposal basically boils down to passing policies that make it cheaper and easier to build new housing here in Portland. I support this ordinance today because it does just that. This ordinance takes a small but significant step towards making it easier and cheaper to build homes in Portland. That's why I'm proud to co-sponsor this ordinance, and that's why I have directed the city's public works bureaus to lean into the effort to make Portland a great place to build a home and raise a family. And now, presiding uh, officer Ryan, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps, and it's good to see everyone. Um, I must say it was, uh, the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, when uh, Director Issa and I saw the audit report um, that said our permitting system needed a lot of work. And uh, it wasn't that clear in the report, you had to dig a little bit, but you could see that what was really the big factor was that we had so many bureaus involved in uh, moving it along. And um, anytime you're doing system improvement, you have to look at all the variables. <laughs> so the big variable that stood out is that on any given assignment, anywhere from five to seven bureaus uh, had a handoff. Well, handoffs have fumbles, if you will, excuse the sports metaphor, or, or there's uh, sometimes um, an opportunity to see it through a different lens and stop the process. And so I just really appreciate uh, all of you. Um, I'm looking at two people that I spent a lot of time with when we first started this, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Maps, for joining in the fun. But we just had to get to the bottom of this. And so I think it's really important that we look at all these tools. But make no mistake, the real issue here is that we have to improve all of our permitting system process, period. And we must continue to press forward on having all the bureaus work together like one team and make sure that we're treating our customers with that type of urgency. Time is money, time is money. That's what you hear constantly from everyone, whether it's an affordable housing, um, advocate or a provider to a big developer to a resident that's merely trying to get their kitchen remodeled. So it was a theme we heard throughout the process. So I want to look both of you in the eye and say thank you for hanging in there. Culture change work is at the heart of the government change that we're all talking about. It's about improving our efficiencies and leaning in at a time when our city is hurting. It's really important for us to improve. Um, how we deliver services to all of our customers. So thank you for your leadership and your willingness and your courage to take this on and have um, hard conversations sometimes with people you really care about on how they need to um, change behavior. Behavior change is always the heart and soul of systems improvement. And adult behavior change, uh, this just in, is really difficult. Um, there's a reason why uh, children tend to excel much better at that than adults. So anyway, it's great to see both here. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for your leadership on this. I look forward to hearing the report and great decision to move this along so we can have more time to vet it and get it right. All right. I pass it back to, the, to you, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Rebecca Esau. I'm the director of the Bureau of Development Services. We're excited to be here today. I've got Kurt Kruger and Rich Eisenhower, who have been key players uh, and done a lot of the legwork here uh, to bring this ordinance to you today. This past February, you passed Resolution 37609 related to increasing housing production. It directed BDS to work with the four city bureaus who have system development charges, or SDCs, to develop a proposal related to when these charges would be paid. Normally, all, permits relate, all permit related fees and charges are paid at the time of permit issuance. Uh, 
By allowing the payment of STCs to be deferred to a point closer to when construction is complete, it reduces the time the owner needs to carry these costs, thereby making the project more financially feasible. Additionally, we heard through the recent regulatory reform survey that providing relief related to the timing of when SDCs are paid would help make housing projects more feasible. BDS doesn't have any SDCs of its own. Our role is to collect those charges for the four bureaus that do have SDCs, uh, and those are PBOT, BES, the Water Bureau, and Portland Parks and Rec. Currently, there's an SDC payment deferral program, and it allows a deferral up to 12 months and charges interest on the payment that's deferred. Also, it's not specific to housing projects. The proposal before you today is related to the housing emergency and is specific to projects with one or more new housing units. It is an option that allows SDC payment to be deferred for up to two years, and it's interest-free. This proposal, uh, proposed option deferral would be in place through August 15, 2025. With the existing deferral program, a lien is put on the, in the, on the property in first position, just as we are proposing with this new deferral option. State law does not require a lien to finance SDCs, but many cities in Oregon use a lien to secure payment of SDCs. Portland, through the Revenue Bureau, it does require a lien with all of the city's SDC financing, financing options. And once a city requires a lien under state law, the lien is required to be first priority when the lien is paid off or in first position as it's referred to. Some stakeholders you'll hear from today have concerns about how lenders may view a lien in first position on a property and impacts this may have on getting financing for a project. I want to highlight that this SDC payment refer deferral is an option people can use if they want to, and it may work well for some housing projects and not for others. We've also heard from some of our stakeholders that they would prefer that there not be a lien on the property and instead have the deferred SDC payment due prior to BDS issuing a temporary certificate of occupancy for the building. This option was discussed early on and not pursued for a number of reasons. First. Unlike a lien, there would be nothing on the title to alert a potential buyer that the SDCs have not been paid and will be due at the time of the temporary certificate of occupancy. Second, not all projects get a temporary certificate of occupancy. Third, the city does not have authority from the state to withhold a temporary certificate of occupancy for non-payment of SDCs, only for issues with the building itself, not complying with applicable requirements. If the building is complete and meets code requirements, we're required to proceed with the inspections, approve them, and allow occupancy. While the proposal before you might not work for all housing projects, based on conversations we've had with stakeholders, we understand it will work for many of the projects that we see and provide a great benefit for a lot of these projects. So my recommendation is that you support this proposal and BDS and the SDC bureaus will continue to work on additional options that could be more available, made available in the future. And with the city's efforts to increase housing production and affordability, it's not going to be a single initiative that's going to turn the tide with our housing crisis, but a combination of steps to address a variety of issues. This ordinance before you today is just one piece of that larger effort and we're committed to this ongoing work. With that, I'll hand it off to Kurt Kruger. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Councillors. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, Director Issa. Um, I want to say thank you for letting us be here. I didn't think I'd be excited to be here on an SDC ordinance, but I am. Um, Commissioner Ryan, you, you had a conversation with me in December about challenging me in a new position as the Executive Manager of Planning and Development, representing all four bureaus. Um, we are here collaboratively, and it was actually easier than I thought it would be, pulling everybody in a room wanting to make this change because people understand in the bureaus that we have to make changes to help our housing crisis in the, Port in the Portland area. Um, this is the first of many things to come. We look forward to being back here many times in the near future with more of these types of initiatives. And we understand there's tweaks that we can continue to make. Uh, following the discussion we've had uh, around this issue in the last 24 hours, other jurisdictions have some other things that we need to look at and we're gonna go do that. And we've already started those conversations of how we can improve on what we're already bringing forward to today. So we're excited to do this. This is the right thing. It's good governance at work right here. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, so I'm Rich Eisenhower. I manage our transportation SEC program manager. So I'm really here for to support Rebecca <clears throat> and Kurt and answer any questions that you have. I know we have a lot of testimony today, so. Great, thank you. Do you have invited testimony? We yes. do? Yes. Why, why don't we let you get to that, and colleagues, uh, then you could ask if there's any burning questions for this panel after the invited testimony, and then we'll go to public testimony. Thank you. Don't go far. Did, did you want to invite the public? Who's inviting the, the, in, the invited testimony? Preston Korst can start from the HBA. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. You just state your name for the record again. Yes. Oops. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Preston Korst. I am the Director of Government Affairs at the Home Building Association of Greater Portland. Um, I am, uh, our, as an association, I always say that we um, represent six counties in over 40 cities um, in, the, in the region. So we do understand how many other jurisdictions do try and implement these types of programs. So that being said, I want to first start off by saying that we do support and appreciate um, the uh, ordinance proposal developed by um, the Bureau of Development Services and want to thank uh, personally, of course, the three folks that were ju just up here, um, especially uh, Director Isa, who has been a critical partner um, throughout this process in the past uh, you know, several years to get this uh, motion to where we are. Um, so to, to basically just to start us off, um, I wanted to mention that on average, this proposal um, as it's written would help save individual developers of all sizes, both from multi-family development to single family detached uh, builders, roughly $5,000 a unit. And that may not seem like a lot at the outset, but that is, um, and that is unlocking just that $5,000 savings of the cost of housing has the potential to unlock hundreds, even thousands of new households um, into the homeownership market. So that alone is enough reason, I think, to uh, vote in favor of this and to work to improve to make sure that it is used by as many developers as possible. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, the, this will create affordability within the uh, housing market. Some might say that this will just be pocketed by the developers. That simply isn't true because it will allow developers and builders to compete against one another and make the process of purchasing or renting a, a home um, more, it will lower the threshold to allow more renters and buyers to access uh, units at a cheaper price point, making these types of units more attractive to those in the market. Um, and additionally, I would like to mention that, um, it, importantly, it will keep capital flowing in the market right now at a time when um, traditional uh, capital and traditional investments in housing is hard to come by. In a moment when rising mortgage interest rates, construction loan interest rates, labor um, is tight, as well as um, constraints in the um, materials and supply chains are making it especially difficult to ensure that capital is continually flowing within the housing market. Um, so this is one thing that will not only reduce price for, for purchasers and renters um, of, of housing in the city of Portland, but it will also ensure that future development is incentivized and continues to uh, go forward at a time when it, not, it, it isn't necessarily a great time to, to attract capital, both nationally and within the market itself. So with that, I will say, um, we urge you, of course, to, to vote in favor of this when it comes uh, back to you in, on the 19th. Um, and in the meantime, I urge you to support and work with um, the Bureau of Development Services as well as others in the development community to make sure that uh, this type of program can be accessed by as many uh, developers and builders as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Esau provided me the list. Next up, we have Lauren Golden-Jones, I believe who may be joining us online. There's Lauren. Good morning, Lauren. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Um, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Lauren Jones with Capstone Partners. Um, I'm also a member of the Development Review Advisory Committee for the past five years, and then president of NAOP this year, the Commercial Real Estate Professional Organization. Um, a little bit about Capstone. We're a Portland-based commercial real estate firm with experience in multifamily, mixed-use office, and industrial development in the city in metro area. Um, we've built almost a thousand apartment homes in Oregon and are either under construction or in planning for another almost 300 apartment homes, um, albeit outside of the city of Portland. 
Um, we care deeply about developing housing in this region and want to continue investing in projects within Oregon. Um, in general, I support the ordinance to defer the payment of system development charge interest free for 24 months. Um, it would help housing developers minimize financing carrying costs. And while this program in and of itself will not solve our housing crisis, it will contribute to decreasing the cost of housing production in the city of Portland. I encourage you and staff to remove the city's existing requirement that a lien be placed in first position on title to secure the deferred SDC payment. Almost all the commercial real estate developed in Portland is done so with construction loan funds. Lenders will absolutely not allow a lien um, from the city to be in first position. Without making this change, this proposed ordinance falls short of achieving its intended outcomes for projects like the ones that I develop. I invite council and staff to amend the ordinance and continue discussions um, over the next couple of weeks with stakeholders to clarify that the city will not require that the deferral be secured by a first lien position. For example, um, Capstone constructed a million um, square foot logistics building in Salem in 2017-18, whereby we deferred 60% of the $3 million worth of SDP fees using a simple agreement with the city of Salem. An unlikely event that we didn't pay the remaining um, amount due after building permit was issued, we would owe back interest and the city would be allowed to lien the property at that time. An alternative concept that uh, Director Esau brought up would be to allow applicants to defer the SDC payment until TCO or CFO or 24 months after building application, whichever is greater. Um, the city will maintain their leverage, um, so no lender or developer, it, as no lender or developer would want to hold up the TCO or CFO. In general, I just want to say that the commercial real estate industry wants to partner with you and staff um, and Director Esau and Kurt Kruger to produce most housing and urges you to pass the ordinance in a way that will allow the possibility to um, construct the most amount of housing in, in the short term. Um, thank you and thank you to staff. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, next up, we have Sam Rodriguez. Hi there. Uh, sorry about that. I was having trouble with my video. Uh, I'm Sam Rodriguez. I'm uh, the senior managing director for Mill Creek Residential. We are also a large um, multifamily developer national. Um, I, I uh, primarily work in Oregon and Southern uh, Washington, and uh, we've developed over 3,000, 4,000 units in the last 10 years and, you know, have a few projects are still in the pipeline for Portland, um, and for Portland proper, as, as well as the suburbs. And we fully support this, uh, this, this, uh, this measure. We think that the postponement of SDCs, I couldn't put it better than Lauren. So I, you know, you, you heard it from Lauren. The, the reality is that um, postponing this will greatly increase IRRs on projects, which will further help finance them at a time where it's really hard, uh, particularly for downtown Portland to get in interest from investors. Any little bit of improvement on the economics will be, go miles in, in trying to get interest from investors to come into downtown Portland. To give you a, a little bit of a, a, depending on the cost of the project, of course, but the SDC fees represent about five to 7% of the overall capitalization of a project. So if you, if you, if you pile on top of that, the interest that we're paying, the very high interest that are being paid these days for banking, I mean, for interest for, for construction loans, it, 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 it makes a big difference if you are able to postpone this for 24 months. I also echo uh, the concern that it's it's a great program, but it's almost useless if we are not if the city is in first lien position. It just makes it impossible. The banks will not accept that. And then the then the lending part just falls apart. So then it, it becomes uh, a moot, a moot par, uh, program. Uh, we definitely believe that there's ways around that. I think uh, Lauren uh, mentioned two, as well as uh, Director Esau. So uh, I think that definitely those need to be put into consideration if this is going to be an effective tool in the in the uh, in, in the toolbox for developers of all types, including the affordable developers. So uh, I would greatly encourage you to approve this with some amended uh, language, which allows the lean position to be moved 
uh, away uh, outside of that and let let the projects be able to find be financed in a in a more straightforward way um thank you and and thank you I, I really appreciate by the way the work that's been done in the background to try and create these tools to further uh the the production of housing and and there I know there's a lot of I listened early on on this there's a lot of whether this is a, a gimme for developers uh trust me it's not it, it's just a tool that allows uh us to 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 produce housing and housing production of all types eventually does equate to affordable housing at different levels that we are only required to have in the city. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, next up, we have Justin Wood. I don't see Justin online director. Esau, do you? Yeah, he's, hang on. Justin, you having troubles? Oh, there, there he is. Nope, there we go. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you, you, we hear you and you, we see you. Thanks for being here. All right, well, thank you and good morning. Um, I, I'm on vacation with the family, so I apologize if I'm not sounding very good, but I wanted to make sure I was on for this. So uh, my name is Justin Wood, and I'm a home builder with Fish Construction here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I want to uh, thank the mayor and commissioners for bringing this forward um, and in support of this issue. Um, I'm, in addition to being a home builder in Portland, um, I'm also a member of Governor Kotek's Housing Advisory Policy Council that was just formed. And one of the things that the governor is trying to do is achieve an ambitious agenda to get 36,000 new housing units built in the, in the state. Um, as somebody who focuses on entry level, uh, first time home buyer homes in the city of Portland, I can tell you that that has become a harder and harder task over the last several years. Um, just trying to make the numbers pencil and trying to get things to actually work out to be able to, to figure this out. This small tool, while it might not seem like a huge deal, um, just on somebody who builds an art entry level homes, if this saving us four to $5,000 per house and we're doing about 20, 000, excuse me, about 20 houses a year, that, that, get, that little bit of extra margin just makes it that much easier. It just gives us one more step to try to be able to achieve the types of housing that we focus on. So again, I wanna applaud Director Esau and the staff for working on this. And, and quite honestly, if Portland passes this, it is my intention to try to bring this forward to the, the Housing Production Advisory Council and the governor as a model that we might be able to use across the state um, to further achieve our housing goals as well. So, um, and lastly, I just, a couple of things that I did want to just point out um, uh, just for anybody, and I don't know if there's going to be much opposition to this, but you know, for, for anybody who doesn't fully understand SDCs and impacts, uh, though they're intended to be impact fees to help pay for the cost of impact um, when we uh, build a new home and when the homeowners live in the system. So, you know, in general, these systems aren't impacted until people are actually living in the homes. So there should not be much of a cost to the city, but um, the the ability for this to help us out is a, is a great help. And then Whoever the commissioner is, and I apologize for not knowing who the commissioner is in charge of the Housing Bureau, I would suggest that if this does pass, that the Housing Bureau uh, be asked to also look into this because several of us use a, a current program already to help defer SDCs for uh, families under 100% uh, of the median family income. And I just want to make sure that these two programs work together well. So again, thank you for taking the time and I hope you were able to support this. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think that completes invited testimony. Is that correct? All right, good. We'll go to public testimony, three minutes each. Name for the record, please. Keelan will call your names. Thank you. Uh, first up, we have Christy White. Good morning, Christy. It's good to see you. I'm uh, Christy White. Thank you for hearing this testimony this morning. I'm speaking for Oregon Smart Growth. We enthusiastically support this option to defer SDCs to facilitate more housing development in the city. I want to thank you for bringing it forward. And that seems like such a plain and regular statement, but really appreciate the incredible effort of Kurt Kruger and Rebecca Esau to bring bureaus together so quickly and come forward with something that protects the city's objectives while also allowing us to facilitate more housing development. I've been doing this in this city for 28 years and I would say for me this feels like a watershed moment of cooperation and creative thinking towards our mutual objectives and it's, it's just fantastic. 
Um, our specific request is what everybody else has already said, is to ask you to consider alternatives. And whether you do that through adopting this program today and talking about it for a couple more weeks to bring back an alternative mechanism or delaying the vote for two weeks, as long as that doesn't stop any housing project <laughs> from uh, utilizing this, uh, I think that, that you could do this either way. Based on our experience with construction financing, requiring this first position lien on property for leverage on SDC contribution is a non-starter for many lenders. We get blue in the face talking to them about how this doesn't have to be that big of a challenge, and yet we are turned down on the first position uh, lien argument constantly. We can assure you that as an alternative enforcement method, withholding a certificate of occupancy, whether that's allowed by the building code or in the alternative, suspending the building permit, which you do have the authority to do, is an extremely ex strong enforcement tool for co collection of a deferred SDC, and that will not discourage investor interest in Portland. We've provided staff with a few examples. Hillsboro has a simple agreement. Salem, as you've already heard, has an agreement, and we'd like to come back to council with some even potentially other options um, for other scenarios in the development community. You do have the flexibility to do this because state law doesn't require that SDCs be paid at permit issuance. You are allowed to pay them later at certificate of occupancy. And it's important to have those other options to be sure we're bringing as many housing projects to the table as we can. We, for example, have 381 units in entitlements in the North Pearl um, that would greatly benefit from deferring uh, nearly $6 million in SDCs. And that project is delivering over 35 IH units. So in sum, we're requesting that you direct staff to evaluate other enforcement options as uh, Director Esau and Kurt Kruger have already discussed, um, providing an alternative to that first position lien and tethering enforcement to something besides that lien and let us get to work building more housing in Portland. And again, thank you so much for the cooperation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up we have Timur Tursernbaev. I think they were planning to join us online. I don't see them. We'll move on to Jesse Ledesma. Hi, Jesse. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and esteemed commissioners. My name is Jesse Ledesma. I'm a small scale real estate develop developer in Portland under my firm, Homework Development. I've been a developer in Portland for 16 years, and it is increasingly difficult to build housing in our city. Um, I actually submitted two building permit applications last week for two missing middle projects under our short stack development umbrella to build 70 units. And with tools like the one on the docket today, we might be able to deliver those more affordably, which is our intention. So I'm testifying in strong support of agenda item 254 for your SDC deferral program. Uh, I definitely applaud city leadership working together with Director Esau, Kurt Kruger, and the other bureau directors really creatively to come together for this ordinance. Um, it's not only a creative tool, but it's a really useful tool for developers, as you've heard today, and I would attest to the same in my own work. Um, echoing what others have said today, though, I strongly encourage those who are working through the program details to eliminate the requirement for the first lien position on the deferral. As Christy White and Lauren Golden-Jones and others have said, that doesn't work with conventional construction financing, which just about every developer needs to build housing. Um, and while not under consideration for the SDC deferral ordinance on your docket today, I also strongly encourage city leadership to consider extending the SDC waiver to affordable housing up to 80% area median income in line with the state housing production definition and target goals. Without tools like that, the private market won't support building missing middle affordable housing at that level. In conclusion, I applaud the city for bringing forth the creative ordinance today to defer SDC payments until uh, 24 months following permit uh, issu issuance, sorry, and um, thank you for your time and efforts in helping to encourage housing production in the city of Portland. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Next up, we have Vic Remmers online. Hi, Vic. Vic, are you out there? Here he comes. 
Can you guys hear me? Yep. See me? We hear you and we see you. Welcome. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mayor and Commissioners, for uh, uh, for having me today. Uh, my name is Vic Remmers. Uh, I'm with Ever Custom Homes. Um, I'm born and raised in Portland. I'm a Portland resident. Uh, we're a local home builder. We've been building homes in Portland since 2009. Um, every year we build hundreds of new homes. Uh, and it's a wide array of product that we do. We do single family homes. We do duplexes. We do townhomes, sixplexes, cottages. And then we do mixed use apartments as well. So uh, we've been providing housing in Portland in a wide array of it. Uh, I totally uh, support this SEC deferral program. I think it will help get a lot more housing off the ground. Uh, we're in a tremendous housing crisis and there's nowhere near enough new homes. I just looked this morning. I mean, there's very few, I'd say probably less than 10 homes in Portland if you wanted to go out and buy under $500,000. And $500,000 is, isn't even, I would say, affordable. And that's, that's how expensive it is to live in Portland and to own a house. Uh, and so doing something like this will get more housing out there, which will help provide you know, lower, lower costs for the housing. And will also provide more competition, which will probably help uh, with some of those pricing. So I think it's a great thing to do. The uh, dealing with the lien on the property, hopefully you guys can figure out a way to navigate that. So um, that's one thing that will cause a problem. Uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up that is an issue uh, in Portland in trying to build affordable housing is uh, the permitting timelines and the permitting process. Uh, it's extremely long to get a building permit. It's very convoluted. Um, they take months. Most projects take years to get approved. Uh, and all this makes it more expensive to build housing. Uh, so it's, I'm hoping it's something that's looked at soon. Um, the code book is way too complicated uh, and the timelines are way too long. So uh, I appreciate uh, you guys looking at this. I think it's a great step and I hope that more stuff comes in the future. Thanks for your time today. Next up, we have Michael Anderson online. Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Michael Anderson. I'm a senior housing researcher for Sightline Institute. We're a regional sustainability think tank. I was a co-founder of Portland Neighbors Welcome, a pro-housing, pro-tenant, grassroots organization. I'm speaking today for Sightline. I'm also proud to serve on the Inclusionary Housing Calibration Work Group, reporting to Commissioner Rubio, which is looking at some of the trade-offs we face when we're trying to reduce the cost barriers to both market rate and below market housing. Today, I'm speaking in favor of this change to one such trade-off, a change that would allow new apartments to come to market at a slightly lower rent. About 5,000 savings per home comes to something like $18 a month for the tenant. And here's why that's worth doing. When new homes can profitably come to market with lower rent, then the landlords of every competing rental home have little choice but to cut their rents by the same amount. The same is true in the opposite direction when we stack up small costs and barriers one after the other, not only do we drive up the rent at which new homes pencil, we also give landlords the market power to raise the price of old homes, a transfer of wealth from tenant to landowner. $18 a month is just $216 a year, but for context, if that $216 were property taxes being paid by the median Multnomah County homeowner, that'd be about what goes to the library system every year. It's a little less than half the fire pension fund. It's about a fifth of what goes to all the public school system. This change alone isn't going to make Portland as affordable as it was when I fell in love with our city. It won't end homelessness. It won't be enough for the median black, Latino or Native American Portlander to afford the median home. It won't accelerate the home building rate enough for Portland to have a housing stock suitable for everyone with mobility challenges caused, for example, by Parkinson's. It is one step in the direction of all those good things. It's worth doing. Other steps will be worth doing too. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, next up, we have Eric Thompson. Welcome, Eric. <clears throat> Hi, all. Uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, really appreciate your time today. It's always a pleasure to get an opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my name is Eric Thompson with Oregon Homeworks. We're a local infill builder here in town. We've been operating for about the past 15 years. Uh, with the passing of the residential infill code, we've pivoted our company from building larger, quite expensive homes to being exclusively focused on providing much needed middle housing options. Uh, we currently have more than 70 such new construction units in the pipeline. 
and to put that into perspective in the 15 prior years operating in Portland, we built about 150 homes and we think we'll build 50 to 70 just over the next year. So for those of you <clears throat> wondering if the residential infill project is making an impact, it certainly is. Uh, almost all of those new homes that we're building will be priced well under the city's median, uh, median price point. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm here to testify today in support of the proposed expansion of the SDC deferral uh, program. Really applaud uh, Director uh, Esau and uh, her team working on all of this. They have been very active reaching out to uh, builders via the HBA recently, and it is uh, not missed that their outreach is making an impact. So this program would definitely have a meaningful impact for middle housing builders such as us, and it'll allow us to lower our development costs, which of course will result in lower housing costs, both for renters and buyers, um, all while virtually having no impact on the city's corresponding revenue. Uh, the simple act of delaying these SDC payments will allow us to avoid, uh, as Preston with the HBA pointed out, thousands of dollars of interest carrying costs that we incurred during the construction process, which we will therefore be able to pass along to our buyers in, in lower price points. Um, and I think it's important to realize that the actual payment of these SDC fees, if deferred, will now correspond with the timing of the actual impact that our new houses have on the city systems. Um, you know, once we're done and somebody moves in, that's when the impact uh, is realized and that's uh, when the payment would then be, uh, be due. Like the other builders and people commenting, I really encourage you to direct city staff to develop an additional route that doesn't require the uh, first lien on the property for all of the reasons that everybody else has pointed out. So uh, really in favor of everything, strongly urge you to support this program. It's a great step in the right direction of reducing costs at every uh, level of housing. So thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thanks, Eric, we appreciate you being here. Next up, we have George Carrillo. George, welcome. Yes, good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Uh, my name is George Carrillo, and thank you to Mayor Ted Wheeler and all of the commissioners today. I'm happy to join all of you in support of this, of this measure. Um, I am currently the executive director of an organization called Latino Built, and we really focus on assisting Latinos that are uh, construction owners and providing them with education and opportunities that have not always been afforded to them. We also provide strong advocacy in order to be able to change the landscape of what the Latino uh, community currently faces. Um, I'm also a former executive of the, at the Oregon Health Authority where I manage the social determinants of health department. And what I want to, you know, in my career, especially in government, I've always had to ask myself, what is the role of government? Are we getting in the way of progression or are we having too much, um, to, are we contributing to too many barriers that's actually limiting our communities from being able to move forward? You know, I am happy to support this, um, this measure simply because of the fact that we are trying to provide um, financial opportunity. And, you know, we say $5,000 isn't a lot. It is, especially with the number of homes that we have to build here in Oregon, we have this big hole that has to be filled. Every single dollar um, matters. And so because of that, I'm happy to support this. I think that we need to be able to come together and really look at the priorities of being able to build affordable housing. How do we as government work within community to be able to meet the cultural needs and the intersectionalities of, of every person that we're trying to house? Um, we have to be able to do this in a collaborative approach, but also be able to do this financially responsible, not to where we are incurring costs and creating barriers that's going to not allow us to develop the, the necessities that we need. And when we think about social determinants of health, especially when related to housing, this additional money will not only uh, have the ability to provide more units being built, but really thinking about what does a community need 
in order to survive. Uh, you know, the walkability, the, the, uh, the accessibility to um, transportation and to mental health and to um, affordable education, all of these things, these cost-saving measures, these are the things that government needs to continue to wipe away to be able to pass down that savings onto the community is trying to serve. You know, with the first position on these, um, on the liens um, that Portland has put themselves in with, with financial institutions, I will tell you that I had one of the largest budgets for the state of Oregon when it came for infrastructure and development. And what I have found is when a government agency puts themselves in first position, because we are always trying to manage risk and we are trying to manage, um, we are trying to manage risk and we are also trying to ensure that we have some sort of control and accountability with the money that we are investing in the community. We have to look at things a little bit differently. I moved away from putting the state of Oregon in first or second position because it didn't make sense. It was too difficult and it made the process very daunting. I do strongly urge the, um, the city to look at a restrictive covenants as another form to ensure that we are securing um, our interest and providing less barriers um, for financing for our developers. I encourage you all to, um, to contact me and engage me so we can have these meaningful conversations because we as a community want to engage in government and understand that we do have a rich cultural history and government history too. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, George. Next up, we have Eric Hagstedt. Hi, Eric. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for having me. It wasn't long ago I was here in support of your emergency homeless plan, and, and you're gonna hear some of what I said at that point as well, some similar sentiment when it comes to real estate development and the limitations and restrictions that my developer clients are facing when trying to produce housing for the market. Um, and as an update, Commissioner Ryan, to my permit that I'm working on for my personal residence, still 15 months now with no end in sight. And that's just for one, that's just for my house, which I don't need, I have another house. But we really wanna build housing for this huge appetite in the market right now. So I'm gonna read my testimony, forgive me. Uh, I'm here today in te to testify in support of item uh, 254 of the, for the SDC interest deferral program. Over the last 20 years in Portland, I've worked alongside my developer clients to deliver hundreds of newly built housing units into our local market. 99% close in Portland east side neighborhoods, 99% would fall under what we call today the middle housing category. Uh, I've, as I've mentioned to you in my previous testimony, all of my residential development business has left the city of Portland. However, we currently have upwards of 100 housing units under construction to be sold into the starved market. Over the next 18 months, Clackamas County, Washington County, Clark County, and Deschutes County, while those counties have their own versions or SDC charges, our builder developers have taken their business out of Portland, not only to out of principle, but for their they're mainly their financial backers, investors, and construction financiers are either refusing or are unwilling to lend on them for their small projects here. And I represent not some of the de developers you've heard from today, but really in the trenches with small time local developers building 10 to 20 housing units in what you would consider the affordable sector. Everyone knows that uh, developing real estate in the city of Portland is fraught with excessive cost, ambiguous and uncertain timelines and inconsistent information. All the while, our job sites are getting robbed, arsoned and vandalized with no police reinforcement to back us up. It's a different but relevant reason as to why people have, or my developer clients have left the building. The city of uh, Portland and Multnomah County are fully stigmatized as a place not to develop desperately needed housing. I say, please do anything you can to lower the barrier to housing, real estate, re residential real estate housing development. Thank you. Thank you. That completes testimony. All right, very good. Why don't we have our original panel of bureau directors come back up? There might be some questions. Colleagues, any questions? I have, uh, Commissioner Maps, did you have a question? 
Why don't you go first? I'm still formulating first my question. First of all, um, I, and I apologize for walking in during your presentation. I had a press conference that conflicted, and so uh, please accept my apologies for that. I always am very interested in what you all have to say, so I'm sorry I missed it by a few minutes. Uh, it's my understanding that the emergency clause has already been removed from this. Is that correct? Yes. So we won't be voting today for those of you who are watching this. We, we will be getting this to the second reading. I do have one question, and it's related to the one issue that people seem to raise repeatedly, and I know it's been raised in previous council sessions around the first lien position. What we heard, uh, if you know, we heard different perspectives, but one theme that seems common is uh, that there is a requirement that it currently exists for commercial developers to not have that first lien position be government. Can, can you, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Do you see that as an issue that needs to be resolved? Or what's your thinking on that? I'm, I'm sure you've, you've thought about this. We are hearing a mix of things from our stakeholders. Um, and it seems the smaller uh, scale developers don't have that same issue as the larger scale developers. And ah, so, okay. um, I'm not sure where in my presentation you walked in, but I was recommending we pass this today and continue to work on an option that might be more suitable for the larger de developers and their financing challenges related to the lien and uh, lien in first position. Very good. And, and just so I understand, w would you be thinking about coming back prior to the second reading with the change? Are you suggesting that this is something we could work on and come back and refine the ordinance later? Uh, it, I'm viewing it as a second ordinance that would come maybe in a, in a month or two months. It's okay. going to take some digging involving with the city attorney. There's state law involved. There's the Revenue Bureau. There's a, it's complicated. Okay, good. I appreciate that. Thanks for that perspective. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this might be uh, vaguely related. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around uh, the implications of moving this from an emergency ordinance today to uh, doing a second reading. Um, do we know, do we have any thoughts on the impact this will have on the effectiveness of the ordinance? For example, I, I think this might delay the implementation of, of this new program by 45 days. Can someone yes, speak to that and help me think about it? Um, by making this, uh, well, by removing the emergency clause. Um, if, if you did proceed with the emergency ordinance, this would go into effect. We could start uh, applying this tomorrow. Um, but we've removed the, the emergency ordinance, so we'll come back in two weeks for a, a second reading, and then the effective date would be 30 days out from that. Am, am I, just to, yeah. to respond, am I right, though, that we could at that point employ an emergency um, in that vote to implement it I defer to the city attorney on that. Yes, if, if council so chose, you've set this to come back on the 19th, you could at that time vote to add an emergency clause right. at that time or thank you or you could today also uh commissioner rubio and the city attorney uh, th uh, thank you for that clarification i uh, we did hear some concerns today that i sure hope that uh staff uh um think about uh, uh um they sound reasonable to me but i'm not an expert in this space and uh i would like to see this program uh stood up right away so i would be very amenable uh when this does come back to us to attaching it to making it an emergency ordinance so we can move quickly. Very good. C Commissioner Gonzalez. Just uh, high level, is there other areas where the city would regularly subordinate a first position? Uh, maybe that's a question for the city attorney, but um, subordinating a first position is, is often a solution to this type of problem uh, at the request of a lender. And I'm just curious, what is sort of the, what's the, City's approach in general uh, to supporting subordinating its lien position. I think we'll have to <clears throat> defer technically to the city attorney, but my understanding under state law, once we have a lien, that lien does require first priority. So you're, we're lien. we're interpreting the state law requirement. If we lien up a property, we have to be in first position, and that that precludes subordination. Yes, there okay. does need to be a lot more research done because there are some specific things related to SDCs in the state law versus the lien section of the state law. So those two are need more clarity to understand. So we'll need more input from the city attorney on that. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? Seeing none, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Next up, item 255, please, it's a report. Appoint Cleo Davis to the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission for a term to expire April 4th, 2027. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to recommend Cleo Davis to fill the vacant public at large seat on the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission for a four year term to expire April 4, 2027. The Historic Landmarks Commission is a seven member volunteer commission that advises city bureaus and city council on matters related to historic preservation and reviews new development in historic districts and alter alterations affecting historic landmarks. The commission typically meets twice a month for several hours at a time, and we appreciate their service and dedication to preserving our historic resources. Cleo is a social design artist whose work looks critically at social, political, and cultural issues using the disciplines of design, historic preservation, economic development, and city policy. He is an advocate for change and currently works as a spatial justice consultant with the Bureau of Development Services and a co-instructor at Portland State University, leading an architecture studio in, creation, in the creation of an Albina Monuments Plan. Cleo and his family have experienced firsthand the negative impacts of city policies that have disproportionately impacted black community, the black community, resulting in a loss of wealth, social cohesion, and architectural legacy. Cleo's work aims to address these harms and provide forums and spaces where local culture can be created and preserved. And we recently heard from the Landmarks Commission about their desires for a citywide cultural resource plan that includes an equitable approach to, approach to preservation and that, ha, that also considers climate, affordability, and economic development. The commission has also asked that the city lead by example in its preservation efforts. And I expect that Clio's addition to this Landmarks Commission will further challenge the city to meet these demands. And I look forward to the next four years of ideas that come from his appointment. I'm very excited to introduce Cleo Davis to the rest of council and invite him to say a few words. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Cleo Davis. Um, I'm excited to uh, be here. I was here about four years ago um, with my family and support from the community um, to address the racist policies that had happened within on a property of ours and also to um, get a house moved onto that property. Um, today, um, because of a lot of that work from four years ago, I'm here today again to be appointed and swear it in or however the process goes for the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, to make it clear, I do have things that I would like to address on the commission on how things are done, how we view um, historic properties as well as cultural preservation. So those two things must be um, combined because of the way we've done things in the past has not worked for um, black folks in particular, um, but pretty much most people here and in Portland or in America and Portland specific. Um, that are considered non-white. So um, I just, I, I, I hope that the city would be open to these changes and suggestions and doing things in a new way that is equitable for all of its, all of its inhabitants of the city. That's pretty much all I have to say unless there's any specific questions. Thank you. Excellent. Colleagues, any questions or comments at this point then? Uh, do we have any public testimony on this side? No one signed up. This is a report. I'll entertain okay. a motion to accept the report and approve the appointment. So moved. Commissioner Ryan Moose, can I please get a second? Second. Commissioner Maps seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you, Cleo, for um, your persistence, first of all. And uh, great to hear your story about being here four years ago. And thank you for also uh, knowing that we'll keep evolving uh, the lens at how we look at historic preservation. And I appreciate you. And I. Gonzalez. 
Cleo, thanks so much for agreeing to serve. I vote aye. Maps. I'd like to thank Mr. Davis for agreeing to serve on this important commission. I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I, Cleo, I want to thank you for your willingness to serve, and um, I think your experience is exactly what the commission needs to continue the important work, and especially during this time. So happy to vote aye. Wheeler. This is an important perspective that you're bringing, and uh, I've watched and appreciated as you've invested in the community through the Albina Vision Trust, through your teaching at Portland State University, and now this is another opportunity to shape how we think about historic preservation and the cultural aspects of historic preservation. It's timely, in fact, it's probably late, uh, but it's a perspective that absolutely needs to be at that table. So we really appreciate your willingness to step forward and uh, once again serve the community. I'm very happy to vote aye. The report is accepted and the appointment's approved. And thank you. Thank you. For the hard work I know you're gonna be doing. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Next item on our agenda today is item number two, pass the consent hour on the regular agenda. Uh, do we need to take a break? Uh, great, why don't, we, why don't we take a uh, 10 minute break and we come back, we'll start the regular agenda with item number 263. We're in recess.
uh, authorized by price agreements for on-call construction services for the small capital unit price contract project for five million dollars colleagues this item authorizes procurement to execute five price agreements with five different construction firms for one million dollars per agreement these agreements will allow the Portland Bureau of Transportation to more easily access to contractors for a variety of small and diverse projects, including signage, striping, installation of ADA ramps, and the like. Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor is here to tell us a little bit more about the report. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. Um, on January 18, 2023, uh, Council approved Ordinance 191145 to complete this project. On February 3rd, 2023, 2023, um, procurement services issued an invitation to bid with a due date of February 28th. Um, in total, five bids were received. The lowest responsive bidders are TS Construction Incorporated, Sandbar Construction LLC, Interlaken Incorporated, Titan Utilities LLC, and Just Bucket Excavating Incorporated. Thus, it is recommended that their bids be accepted and the estimated unit price is quoted for a total amount of $1 million per, per agreement. Price agreements for on-call construction services are intended to be used for projects whose specific scope and budget are not predetermined. Work performed on the, under these price agreements will be authorized via, uh, via written task orders when projects are identified. An aspirational goal of 20% utilization of business enterprise is certified by the Certification Office of Business Inclusion and Diversity, also known as COBID, will apply to each individual task order. And the, contract, the contractors awarded these price agreements have committed to make good faith efforts to achieve the utilization goal. Each task order will be negotiated to subcontract with COBID certified enterprises to the maximum extent possible. I'd like to point out that each uh, awardee on this contract is a COVID certified uh, contractor, but they also will make good faith efforts to subcontract with other COVID certified contractors um, per each task order. Briefly, I'll give you a brief um, overview of each company. Sandbar Construction is located in Salem, Oregon, and is a state COVID certified ESB contractor and is a Caucasian female-owned firm. Interlaken is located in Fairview, Oregon, and that's also a state COVID WBE contractor, woman-owned business. They have a current City of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of city's contracting requirements. Titan Utilities LLC is located in Sherwood, Oregon, and that is also a state-certified ESB contractor, woman-owned firm as well. They do have a current City of Portland business tax registration. Lastly, Just Bucket Excavating Incorporated, that is located in Albany, Oregon, and is a state certified MBE contractor. That is an African American owned firm. They do have a current City of Portland business tax registration. So the total will be, you know, task order here will be uh, five million, one million is allocated to a black owned firm. Work performed under the price agreements will be funded from each individual project CIP budget, and that, is, that, that budget has been established for fiscal year 24. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to in, answer them. We also have PBOT project manager Scott Clement, either in attendance in person or on phone, I'm not quite sure. That concludes my presentation. Thanks, Director Taylor. Questions at this point? Any public testimony on this item? No one saying This it. is a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Report's accepted. 264, an emergency ordinance. A man contract with McKinstry Ascension LLC for energy savings performance contracting services not to exceed $18,500,000. Colleagues, Portland Parks and Recreation has joined us to present phase two of its energy savings performance contract, which seeks to improve pathway lighting at an additional 12 parks. 
add more efficient heating and cooling systems at Peninsula Park Community Center and modernize the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems at Charles Jordan Community Center, as well as the East Portland Community Center. We are joined by Beaker, Biko uh, Taylor, as well as Project Manager Chris Silkey. But before we do that, I'd like to ask the Commissioner in charge, Commissioner Ryan, if he has any comments that he'd like to add. Sure, I do. And thank you, Mayor. And also, thank you for your support on this uh, process that we've been in. Colleagues, with new bureau assignments uh, always come some early surprises, and this item was on the top of that list for sure. My gut and common sense was a little troubled by the plan and that was supported by many prior to being included in this decision. However, I also respected what I was listening to, so it was complex. And these are the moments I'm reminded as an elected commissioner, I'm a liaison between the community and the city public servants who work uh, in our bureaus. This is a good thing because we as elected officials uh, must be independent and listen to both sides. And in this case, dialogue made it clear that the city needed to pivot its method for, re for the remedy of this urgent challenge. I wanna thank the public for sharing their experiences with my office and lending their time and voices in this dialogue. Today, we are taking action to move forward with this balanced approach as quickly as supply chains allow and as to move forward with balance as we also address our safety in our parks. I also want to thank the parks team, and I really mean that, and a couple of them are here today, for their openness and their agility with my office as we aim to get this right. With that, I'll turn this back to you, or to you, Chief Procurement Officer Rico Taylor, and I'm really happy to see Chris here from Parks as well as we move forward. Take it away. Excellent. For the record, I missed this. I'm Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor. Um, today we're here to amend contract 3000070025 with McKinstry Ascension LLC for energy savings performance contracting services. The current contract amount is $1.071 million and it incorporates change orders one and two. Um, the GMP2 amendments cost is anticipated to be 14.5 million. That includes the emergency approved change orders three and four for pole and for pole based light removals. An additional amount of 2.928 million is being requested as a contingency in the case of other issues arising during construction and change orders that may be required in the future. Um, this new contract, um, we're seeking approval to not, is a not to exceed value on a new contract of $18.5 million. Uh, a couple points on uh, minority participation during stage one. We recorded a 40% uh, DMWESB utilization. And on stage two, we we're gonna anticipate a 36% participation for minority and uh, MWBS uh, participation in this project during stage two. So Parks has done, gone above and beyond to ensure that there is inclusion on this, on this contract. Uh, for that, I'll turn it over to Chris Silkey. Great, thank you, Biko. Uh, thank you and good morning. My name is Chris Silkey. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the program manager for asset management for Portland Parks and Recreation and managing this energy savings performance contract. First, I'll provide a brief overview and then be available for your questions. I'd also like to acknowledge the support and partnership of procurement, uh, Chief Procurement Officer Taylor, uh, Kelly Davis McKernan, also the support of the city attorney's office, Andrea Jacobs team at the Bureau of Planning and Sustain Sustainability, and Jana Pepefemu, the Chief Resilience Officer with the Bureau of Emergency Management. So this type of contract is a little different than many traditional procurements in that the contractor actually guarantees the level of energy savings that, that results from the contract and then it's measured and verified in the out years and the contractor makes up for any shortfalls financially or otherwise remedies the situation. This amendment builds on stage one, which was a pilot project for Portland Parks and Recreation where we upgraded lights and other equipment in multiple parks that resulted, we know this, resulted in $79,000 per year in avoided cost and a reduction in 137 tons of carbon equivalent um, emissions. So in this stage two, we'll be replacing the light poles in 11 parks and upgrade the heating and cooling systems in three community centers, Charles Jordan Community Center, Peninsula Park Community Center. And I wanna point out that for Peninsula Park Community Center, we're also adding air conditioning in gymnasiums that didn't have it before. So it, it is an improvement there. Uh, as well as East Portland Community Center, the upgrade there supports the Climate Emergency Work Plan goal of developing a resilient hub at East Portland Community Center. It's a more resilient system, has multiple modes of operation that will uh, future-proof that center. 
the, the work covered by this amendment should reduce greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 350 tons of carbon equivalent. And again, we, we do anticipate use of COBID certified subcontractors for over 35% of the contract value. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions at this point? Do we have any public testimony on this item? We do. Uh, first up, we have uh, many. How many folks? Oh, sorry. How many people? Uh, we have, I believe, five people signed up. All right, three minutes each, name for the record. If you guys want to cool your heels over there, you're welcome to. Thank you. First up, we have Mitch Pierce. Welcome. Thanks for being here. First, I want to thank Commissioner Ryan for a pivot and trying to find balance on this issue. Um, we're appreciative, I'm appreciative, and I think a lot of neighbors are of the pause on removing any more lights from the 12 parks. Um, however, we, I, seek some amendments and some changes uh, to item 264. Portland parks are for everyone. So is common sense safety and good governance. I'm here to ask that you turn the lights back on all park pathways as thoughtfully and with modifications that I will mention that include public input and consideration of neighborhood security, pole design, and light pollution mitigation. Because of broad-based outrage over light removals from parks in four east side neighborhoods and planned removal and replacement of lights in eight others, it's imperative that the city follow its own excuse me, community governance principles and public equity goals of inclusion. Ten of the parks that are earmarked for light pole removal are on the east side, which has those of us who live on the east side somewhat concerned. The project fails to follow Portland's binding principles to engage community as part of solutions. Where was the engagement in Selwood, Buckman, Mount Tabor, neighborhoods, and Irving Park? Instead, with item 264, PPNR proceeds to inform rather than involve the public in its emergency expenditure request. By approving the request, item 264 should be amended to draw from capital set-aside funds and comply with the city's public involvement principles. When the city began removal of 243 light poles, it was reported that only two parks would get light replacements, heightening concerns about implementation of a special parks taxing district to cover that and 600 million deferred park maintenance and repairs. The issue is bigger than park lampposts. Outrage has cut across demographic and geographic interests because it goes to the heart of Portland's increasing failure to provide meaningful public discourse and collaboration. We all know that Portland is losing population, sadly, and not everyone can afford to move. I cannot tell you how many people I have talked to who have said they want to leave. Uh, not everyone can afford to leave, and that's why parks are so important. We ask... What is the specific danger posed by the lampposts? What were the processes and criteria for PPNR's inspection? Why have project costs ranging from $4 million to $15 million been so inconsistent? Have requirements for different parks lighting needs, such as upcoming movie nights and Mount Tabor's National Historic Registry designation, been considered? Finally, like Diogenes holding a lamp in search of one good man, we ask that the city turn the lights back on for all Portlanders. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. I do have a request. Um, Nikki Mandel was also supposed to be here to testify. I have her testimony, if I can read it into the record. Is she on the list? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, unless there, there's no objections, is there? Great. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, she was relieved to read PPNR's March 29th press release indicating the improved light pole safety project. Um, pausing the light pole removal timetable is an excellent first step. It must not end the story. She wants to know what specifically is the danger posed by the light poles and what is the proposed solution that the only way to address the danger is posed by light poles. According to available public information, the light pole project is the city's response to a potential lawsuit related to an accident that occurred in June 2022. I'm sorry for the injury, since neither you nor city officials have denied this or offered any other evidence-based explanation, I and others must 
conclude that this account is accurate. The city's light pole safety project website states that PPNR devoted unspecified hours and funds for city personnel and a contractor to inspect 1,000 park light poles within a matter of months. There are a number of unanswered questions about this process and report. Uh, some of them, I've mentioned them before, the criteria for inspection, when and how were the inspections con conducted, were the poles eyeballed, installation blueprints consulted, were structural st stress tests compliant with industry standards for lighting poles, um, what specifically are the hazardous structural anchoring issues that were found, why hasn't the full report been made public, what other solutions aside from removal and replacement were considered and what, why was each deemed inadequate. So thank you. That's part of her testimony. I believe the rest is in the public record and will be made available to you. Thank you. Appreciate thank it you for very your much. time. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Ryan yeah. has a comment. Mitch, uh, two people from Parks are here. Could you raise your hand, both Lauren and Chris, if you could engage with one another and uh, we will make sure that Parks goes out to the community and does a, a couple um, engagement sessions, to your point. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Jan Hanley. Jan was planning to join online. Is Jan here? No, okay, we'll move on to John Larson. Welcome, John. Thanks for being Thank here. And I know it's repetitive, but if, if you could state your name for the record, yes, we I sure will. appreciate it. Thank you. Mayor and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to, to weigh in on this important topic. My name is John Larson, and I'm a longtime member of the uh, board member of the Mount Tabor Neighborhood Association. We in the MTNA are concerned about the process that is underway to remove and replace the historic lampposts throughout Portland's wonderful park system. Portland Parks and Recreation's effort throughout has been in clear violation of the city's binding public involvement principles. Those principles state, among other things, that, quote, public involvement is an early and integral part of issue and opportunity identification, concept development, design, and implementation of city policies, programs, and projects, end quote. That is, public involvement is required to take place before a bureau embarks on a project that has such a wide-ranging impact. We know that residents near other parks that have already had their lighting removed were shocked and dismayed at the lack of notification or warning and at the speed with which the removal was carried out. It is gratifying that the council now proposes to find the money to replace all the lampposts that are slated to be removed, and all of us are grateful for that. As yet, though, there is no publicly available information as to what that replacement lighting might turn out to look like and how it will function in the park setting. As you know, Mount Tabor Park is on the National Historic Register. Its historic lampposts are major contributing factors to that de designation. And of all city parks, Mount Tabor is slated to have the most historical lampposts removed, 81. We at Mount Tabor are therefore particularly concerned about what the replacement lighting will look like and whether it will be compatible with the park, whether it will be an enhancement rather than a detriment. I should tell you, that we suffer from a bit of PTSD with regard to the Parks Bureau. Back in 2006, the Bureau signed a secret memorandum of understanding committing to the sale of eight and a half acres of Mount Tabor Park for private development. And it made this commitment with zero public involvement. Indeed, the negotiation was entirely clandestine. When rumors began to swirl, the Bureau came to the Neighborhood Association and swore to us that no such plan existed. Only through a FOIA request was the MOU revealed. That MOU being brought into the light of day caused the sale to be halted. It led to a public apology by the then director of the Bureau and an offer of mediation with the Neighborhood Association to try to repair the damage that had been done to our relationship by the Bureau's behavior. A large group of community volunteers entered into that mediation process. The upshot of our mediation was an agreement that PPNR would henceforth be transparent with the, re with the public in regard to any significant changes to the park. In effect, a commitment to abide by the public involvement principles. Clearly, the removal of a historically and functionally important aspect of the park constitutes a significant change. After coming to this agreement, a group of us then spent another year of our volunteer time collaborating with the Bureau to redesign the Mount Tabor Park Central Maintenance Yard, construction of which is now finally underway. Those of us who participated in these efforts are still very proud of our collaborative work with the Bureau. 
One outcome of that planning effort was that Opsis Architects, the firm that the Bureau hired to work with us on the redesign, succeeded in finding a contemporary manufacturer that has the ability to produce lampposts similar in character to the ones that are in the park presently and are slated to be removed. That work, presumably now of even greater value, was accomplished at taxpayer expense. We at the MTA, MTNA still have that institutional history, but of course we have no idea whether PPNR has retained that knowledge because of its complete lack of transparency around the replacement project and the process of choosing replacement lighting. We have no desire sorry, to be in an adversarial relationship with PPNR. I will get to the wrap point. this up. What we are seeking, rather, is to work in partnership with the Bureau on this issue. We ask Commissioner Ryan that you direct the Bureau to work with the public in an open and transparent way and in accord with the City's public involvement principles to determine the appropriate replacement lampposts. We look forward to participating in a Citizens Advisory Committee to ensure that the solution that is arrived at is the best one for the next 100 years of Portland's park system to working with the Bureau and other residents throughout the city who care about our parks toward that end. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, uh, John, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And Chris and Lauren are there. They'll uh, be able to work with you as well. I do want you to know that the historic Landmarks Commission has seen the lamppost and they are doing a full review and are supportive. So there is a process on that. And so if you could uh, connect with them and we'll make sure yeah, that we go forward. But that's, that's not really a public involvement process. I mean, the fact that we get to weigh in after a decision has been made is entirely different from allowing us in the room to participate in in helping to inform that decision. Yes, John, that's the pivot's in motion, I hear you, and that's why we're making new decisions based on that. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Heather flint -Chotto. Heather, welcome. Three minutes, please name for the record. Hi there, Heather flint -Chotto, the director of the Portland Main Street Design Initiative. I'm also a small business owner and urban planner. Uh, my firm is Forage Design and Planning. I live in Southeast or, uh, Portland, and I just wanted to speak on this same issue and um, wanted to first, before I get started, just say good job on the SDC deferment. I fully support that, as well as uh, congratulations on appointing Cleo Davis to the Landmarks Commission. That's good moves on both fronts. Uh, I wanted to support the messages of the previous testifiers, both John Larson and Midge Pierce. I agree with those issues. Um, I would like to share just a couple images of a slide. I may. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. I think that this um, transparency and decision making is really at the heart of a lot of these issues that communities are feeling many. From the, the outreach and engagement that we do with PDX Main Streets, we hear this a lot that we don't, community members are not feeling that they are part of this process. And I know, Dan, Commissioner Ryan, with your, your new role with Civic Life, this is a real opportunity and, um, and a challenge. And we'd love to actually talk to you more sp explicitly about that and some suggestions we have, some, um, some work that we've already done that we can bring to you um, and some formats. But this review of alternatives, is it's, it's not really feeling like there is much more than a top-down process and a, and a bottom-up process. We, we really could get back to where we have been with a robust engagement. And, you know, just for example today, in the way that the information is on your agenda, of course, I'm a planner, I understand it, but it is not accessible to the public. And information, like even with DOZA, design overlay zoning amendments, that doesn't engage people in what design standards and guidelines are, right? We need to use, we need to stop using that plannerese and make it more um, digestible and accessible for communities. If you really want them to participate in things they already care about, please work on that. Second, I wanna just say that, that we've invested a lot in those light posts and, oops. And so we wanna make sure that we keep those historic lamps and not just donate them give them away. They're valuable. They were paid for by the community and they should not be sold off without public involvement. I'd like to have input in the design of those replacement lamps and the quality of the light and the materials and the opportunities to salvage and reuse what we can. Um, there is a really important um, IAP2 
standard of engagement, and we are doing just the inform. That's what your documentation that you're looking at right now says the process will be is inform. And I really want to encourage you to move to the involve because we need to do more than just the minimum. And then lastly, I would just say there's some really important impacts to lighting. I have spent my career working in energy efficiency, but there's um, some negative effects too. So really paying attention to how that can influence bird behavior and um, impacts to migration and sleep and other uh, me metabolic effects. Those are really important. And then there's a wide range of choices that we can be looking at. Community is that really sets the tone as an urban designer, the type of lighting you have, whether it's ambient lighting or safety lighting, those are very different scales. And they also often have a different tone and identity to a place. And those can be customized and communities really could lend a lot of support for you on that. So there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And we'd really like to have an opportunity to have that dialogue and be part of that solution. So thank you for taking action to make it happen at the same time, but don't skip this piece of engagement because the quality of the light has big psychological impacts and as well as, um, as impacts to our environment. So thank you for doing more, um, moving on the scale of the IEP too. Thank you. Thank you, and, and colleagues, I'm trying not to be the time police, uh, but we have a really full agenda and a number of us are due up at OHSU pretty soon and I wanna get through the agenda and there's a lot of people waiting for agenda items. So uh, as much as I don't like to do it, when you get to three minutes, we're going to cut you off. Please make your argument in three minutes or less. Uh, that is 50% more time than the legislature gives you, just FYI. Next individual, please. That actually completes testimony. That completes testimony, great, thank you. Uh, any further discussion on this item? Please call the roll. Ryan. Colleagues, after listening to ideas and concerns from community members and exploring other options, we have made a balanced plan that can address the safety issue in a more timely manner. I'm pleased this contract amendment allows Portland Parks and Rec to purchase necessary light pole replacements as soon as possible. With this new funding secured, we will also be able to phase the removal and replacement of these light poles in a shorter time frame. The funding effort is an example of different government agencies working together to solve a problem. Safety is a top priority, top priority in our park system, and this new plan allows us to balance the different ways we think about safety. The critical investment in Portland Park System will not only improve the safety of the parks, but also improve the overall experience of our parks after dark. I wanna thank the people here from Parks Department that are moving forward with us and with the community. Thank you for your testimony today. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to praise Commissioner Ryan for digging into uh, this project. Clearly, it is complex and uh, nuanced. Um, I also want to thank everyone who testified today. Um, I was also heartened to see Commissioner Ryan's direction to the Parks Bureau to engage with uh, members of the community as we go about maintaining and upgrading our infrastructure um, in our public spaces and parks. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote on. Rubio. Um, thanks, uh, Biko, for uh, your work on getting this to council. Thanks to Commissioner Ryan and the teams of parks for finding uh, funding through this. Um, I'm also particularly appreciative of the important advances towards the climate emergency work plan contained in the project, um, improving, you know, modernizing our heating and cooling ventilation systems in these three community centers will use energy more efficiently or more efficiently and provide a safe respite for community during uh, climate crises in the city and um, improving the pathways to lighting at parks increases safety and addresses our energy consumptions by using more efficient light bulbs which is also very great um, I'd also like to acknowledge the use of dark sky compliant fixtures. This is incredibly important for the wildlife as well within the parks. Um, uh, as it was mentioned, we all get ex unexpected surprises to navigate when we, we acquire new bureaus, and especially in the midst of developing situations. But I want to emphasize that no major maintenance projects were approved during my oversight of the Parks Bureau, and they were not canceled or delayed. The light pole safety project funding is simply taking cash of uh, taking advantage of the cash balance Portland Parks and Rec currently has, and the stream of general fund ma major maintenance it receives on an annual basis. So I want to thank again 
the park staff for their work and Commissioner Ryan for diving deep and ensuring the parks remain lit as much as possible during these improvements. Happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Next item, 265. Amend contract with PTG Oregon LLC, DBA Premier Truck Group of Portland for the purchase of vehicles to extend term and increase not to exceed amount by $40 million. Colleague, City Fleet is responsible for maintaining and replacing all city-owned vehicles to ensure that city work requiring transportation can be fulfilled. This item authorizes City Fleet to extend its contract an additional five years to facilitate that work. The amount requested in the amendment is all part of the fleet's regular replacement fund activity. Fleet Business Operations Supervisor Alan Bates is here to walk us through the ordinance. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Council Mayor. Thank you for the time. Um, this is uh, this is really a um, uh, a contract that you know we already have in place. It's a vendor that uh, we use, uh, we have used for many years. Uh, they they are the dealer of record for Freightliner trucks, which is one of the primary truck brands that the city purchases for all of its operations. And this uh, this ordinance simply um, increases that amount and extends that amount so that we can buy all the trucks that uh, we need. And moreover, um, you know, Freightliner is in our backyard. Um, they're part of the the Daimler Truck North America Group, so they're on Swan Island. <clears throat> we like to support, you know, obviously our uh, our local companies as well, and um, I think for all uh, you know, all reasons, uh, you know, th this this amendment and contract is obviously important for us to be able to do our 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 jobs and provide the the vehicles that we need for the city. Very good. Uh, thanks, Alan. Any questions? Any public testimony? No one signed up. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thanks, Alan. Thank Next you. Next item. 266, please. Authorized letter of agreement with Portland Firefighters Association, Local 43, to implement a mandatory callback policy. Colleagues, Portland Fire and Rescue has had challenges filling daily staffing vacancies through voluntary callback shifts and currently lacks an official mandatory callback policy. This agreement establishes a policy that allows fire and rescue to mandate members to work in order to ensure that there's adequate daily staffing of all resources. It also offers incentive pay when all staffing vacancies are filled via voluntary callback. Labor Relations Coordinator Anne-Marie Kavorki and Matty Fire Division Chief Ryan Gillespie and City Attorney Fallon Niedrist are here to walk us through the ordinance, but before I do that, I'll ask the commissioner in charge if he has any introductory remarks. Commissioner Gonzalez. I do. Thanks so much for being here today. This uh, agreement provides fair compensation for Portland's firefighters for unprecedented levels of forced overtime. This is a much needed adjustment to get us through the year before we can address in a more fundamental way deeply rooted problems in Fire Bureau's staffing model. Because longer term, addressing the Fire Bureau's structural staffing gaps is critical not only to the city budget, but to our emergency system as a whole and the health and well-being of fire's rank and file. I'm proud to support this amendment and to be fighting for fire staffing in the city's upcoming budget and thank Labor Relations and PFFA and the city for their hard work in reaching this important agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Anne-Marie Kevorkian Maddy, uh, Labor Relations, uh, joined again by Division Chief Gillespie, uh, City Attorney Fallon Niederst, and then somewhere behind me, uh, PFFA President Isaac McLennan. Um, and we're here this, uh, I guess it's afternoon now, uh, to present this ordinance to you, uh, which creates the mandatory callback policy for PFNR. Uh, just a few highlights. Uh, over the past 18 months, Portland Fire and Rescue has had difficulty filling da daily staffing through the use of volunteer callback shifts and has implemented the use of mandatory callbacks. Uh, so that's forced overtime uh, for those of you that wouldn't be familiar with that term. In addition to the mandatory callbacks, the Bureau has occasionally shut down frontline apparatus to manage those staffing deficits. Uh, the Bureau currently does not have a mandatory callback policy. Uh, and uh, needs a defined mandatory callback policy to set expectations and guidelines on how mandatory overtime will be assigned to provide appropriate rest accommodations and define 
how to manage employee refusals of the mandatory callbacks. And so in November of 2022, uh, the parties exercised their rights under the uh, uh, ORS uh, and entered into expedited bargaining to seek resolution towards the creation of a policy. And I just wanna highlight that we're using an interest or that we used an interest-based model uh, to seek a creative resolution to resolve the issue related to the callbacks and uh, collaboratively came up with, um, I think, again, creative solutions to ensure um, the ability for Portland Fire to maintain adequate daily staffing of their resources and also allow them the ability to mandate members to work. And this program would work in conjunction with daily staffing and assignment of members to the normal process of also volunteering through callback coverage. So this agreement will provide an immediate implementation of a callback policy, um, which will become a permanent part of the successor agreement. We're in current contract negotiations today. In fact, literally today. Uh, the city will provide an incentive payment of $100 per voluntary callback shift worked under the following terms. So we have an eligible period between February 16th, 2023 and June 30th, 2023, which is the expiration of the current contract. That's 134 days. The incentive of $100 would be applied to all voluntary callback shifts, uh, including full and partial shifts, and would apply only when all vacancies had been filled for the day through voluntary callbacks, meaning no mandatory callbacks were required. In addition, uh, we would also, uh, this agreement also provides a clean slate uh, from the Bureau's perspective, removes any previous or pending counseling or disciplinary action for mandatory callback refusals, and the union agrees to dismiss its related grievances with prejudice. And finally, uh, another component of a creative uh, resolution here is that members will once again be permitted to use city paid water to wash their personal vehicles as part of their permitted leisure time. Uh, when this agreement is adopted, uh, the chief, uh, Chief Sarah Boone, will effectuate this as official compensation by rescinding her memo. Um, and uh, Portland Fire, Fire Association, I'm try that again, PFFA, <laughs> will agree to dismiss with prejudice its current grievance over car washing, which is currently set for an arbitration hearing. Um, just a little additional, uh, the fiscal impacts um, for this uh, agreement are presumptive based on how many days are actually filled through voluntary callbacks. Uh, associated costs could be up to um, $483,000, again, that would assume that all voluntary callbacks are filled uh, for all 134 days uh, using an average of 36 shift vacancies per day. Um, the incentives, again, apply only when daily staffing is met through voluntary callbacks. Uh, the incentive period, again, expires at the end of this current fiscal year on June 30th. Um, additionally, the Bureau is requesting any existing fiscal year 22-23 labor set aside funds from council or any contingency uh, funds through the general fund to cover the increased costs as a result of this amendment. Uh, without the use of general, general fund contingency resources or labor set aside, the Bureau does not have discretionary funding available within their existing budget and so therefore would suspend any spending on materials and services and capital projects, including the purchase of equipment and uh, possibly limiting services provided. Uh, let's see, full resolution, as Commissioner Gonzalez mentioned, is comes with the council approval to properly fund the Bureau. I know that's something that's on the budget um, discussion down the road, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that for y'all. If you have any questions. Could you restate available. what you just said? Which what, piece? What was the last part about the budget? Uh, the full resolution to the Bureau's um, ongoing staffing issues comes with a council approval to add additional FTEs to uh, the Bureau's funding model. That is so. not a requirement, however, of this particular ordinance. It is not a requirement. It's just an editorialization, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I wanted to make that clear. Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Discussion, any comments? Um, I'm sure Gonzalez I, do believe and I, we, I have a question. Yeah, we might have a invited testimony. Uh, uh, Mr. McConnell, are you inclined to speak today? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's why I asked if there was any testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Wheeler, Council, thank you for your time. 
My name is Isaac McLennan, I'm President of Portland Firefighter Association. I've submitted uh, testimony electronically uh, for your purview with some uh, uh, detailed information. Uh, it's not too long, not too lengthy, worth a read. Uh, I would just want to articulate a couple of things. Number one, we didn't get to this agreement easily. This has been a long uh, process to get to this. That started a year ago, and this is the culmination of that effort collaboratively, I would add, and with compromise on both sides. Uh, as you all well know, firefighting is a dangerous job. We are twice as likely to develop cancer. One in four of us have thoughts of suicide. There are impacts to our health and wellness. Our bodies take a beating. Um, that's all because of the work we do, and that's at the required 50.4 hours a week. That does not count for the increase in overtime that we're working. Some members are working over 100 hours a week, and you can just see how that would magnify those impacts to the work. So knowing that we have to keep our city safe and us firefighters on the job need to be safe with proper staffing, we are subjecting ourselves to increases to our, or decreases to our health and wellness. Um, that's part of this concept of this. And regarding the car washing, um, uh, it's, it's not an exercise in, in uh, vanity. This is really about firefighters having a mechanism, something to do in their downtime, uh, when they're at work, if they're required to be at work for lo long periods of time, a third of our lives at minimum uh, to be there. And this is just utilizing our downtime in a sparing way that provides a, really a mental health break. It's something that's very simple, it's tedious, it's, um, it's repetitive, it's a, it's a calming thing to do uh, when coming back and, and really debriefing from stressful calls or of any kind of nature. So this is a long-standing practice that's been around since water, soap, and cars all existed at firehouses. And I say firehouses because while they're not ours, they, we treat them like they're ours. We do, uh, all, we, we keep those stations maintained well. We take great pride in the place we work, the apparatus that we drive around in the city to protect us, just the same way we take pride in what, in, in our own, in our own uh, homes and well-beings. And this, the, 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 the mandatory overtime piece is, is, is hard for all of us to stomach, to know that we could be forced to work at, at 15 minutes prior to us going home, knowing that we're gonna be at work for 24 more hours, we have to quickly call home, figure out childcare, what's our spouse gonna do. It's been a real damage to, our, to uh, not only to firefighters and our health and wellness, but to our, our spouses at home. So uh, understanding all of that, we urge council to support this ordinance and adopt this agreement. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and before you leave, um, at the risk of being unpopular, I support all of the financial aspects of this, and I really appreciate the hard work it took to close the gap. And I know that this has been a very, very difficult and very, very contentious issue. But I would be remiss if I didn't say there was a collective groan in my office and I was certainly part of it when I read about the car washing piece being included in an ordinance. And I realize that this is a practice that has been around for a long time, but it made this whole discussion in the eyes of the public almost farcical because what they expect from us in a time of crisis is for us to lead in ways that show we understand the pressures that the public is under, because they're also in crisis. And the image of people washing their cars who are on the payroll, notwithstanding everything you said about the fact that people are required to live here, this is part of the process. I agree with you on the, the mental health components of this, and, and we've had really good conversations about that. I think we're taking great steps with HR, uh, and the fire bureau to address those issues, but it brought something to the table that I wish was not in this ordinance. I wanna be very clear on that point. Uh, I'll support the financial package because I think the financial package is important. I can live with the car washing because it's de minimis, but I just have to say from the perspective of the public, I I've never had to answer as many questions as I've had to answer this week about any labor agreement we've ever reached because this one people get and symbolically it's a dog to tell people that they can come to work on the public dime and wash their cars. And I'm just sorry that that, that 
perspective was not carried through these conversations. Now, I also understand there's a flip side to this that is pragmatic, and the flip side is the grievance goes away, and that's good. I'd like to see that grievance go away, because it looks silly, frankly, for the city council to be fighting with a labor union over something that, frankly, as, as I say, I believe it's frivolous. I really do. There's lots of ways that I address my own mental health needs. I read, I work out, uh, I take vigorous hikes. Um, it doesn't have to be washing your car on the job. And so I, I just want to say that. Uh, you know, I'm enthusiastically supportive of the rest. And I appreciate the work HR did with the union. I'm glad we've reached this agreement. But I just wish that one component wasn't in it. I'm still not clear why it needs to be an ordinance. I don't understand why that's not the purview of the commissioner in charge and the police chief. Uh, but it's there, or excuse me, the fire chief, but it's there. Uh, and I can live with it, but I just have to say that on the record. Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I, I, I support this. I'm going to vote for it when it comes to, to back back to council. I'm not an expert in this field, uh, but I do understand that it would help us uh, manage some staffing issues over in one of our critical public safety bureaus. I just wanted to make, I won't even put it in the form of, well, it'll be a question and both a statement. Um, if there's an operational advantage to making this an emergency ordinance so that we can begin to manage our people more effectively right away, I would be open to that. I'll, um, I'll, maybe I'll ask uh, staff if they have any perspective on that. And um, I, I, I unfortunately didn't connect with Commissioner Gonzalez beforehand, so I don't, I don't know, I haven't had, had given him a chance to think about it too, but it's something which occurred to me as I heard today's testimony. Uh, first, is there an operational advantage to implementing this quicker? Absolutely. We would definitely support moving this to an emergency ordinance if that's something supported by council. Okay, I'll, I'll, knowing that, I'll, I'll say I, I, if Commissioner Gonzalez is uh, supportive of that, I would be open to that. Totally supportive of that. Uh, and we're gonna need to state for the record what the emergency is, and I, I didn't hear a complete sentence on that. Uh, by creating an emergency ordinance, this would allow us to immediately put this policy into effect uh, as of today, and uh, it would allow the uh, payroll processing to begin for that incentive. Um, as quickly as possible, as opposed to an additional 30 days. And for me, this feels like an emergency because uh, firefighters are our first responders. They do life and death work. Uh, I know we have a staffing problem here. Uh, anything that we can do to actually ha help that system uh, work more effectively um, in this fiscal year strikes me as being important. Is, is there a fiscal impact to the fire bureau budget? If so, what is it? Uh, the fiscal impact to the Bureau is still uh, associated at approximately $483,000 if all voluntary callbacks over the 134-day period are filled at 36 vacancies per day. So costing us remains presumptive whether or not you, so you choose you to do this as an emergency ordinance going, or otherwise. Because you, you plan for this to be non-emergency. If we implement it effective today, you can absorb that in the Fire Bureau's existing budget? While they would prefer to have existing labor set aside question. funds, my yes, the answer is yes, yes, they could. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, uh, um, I, I, yeah, I'd like, it, if you have any concerns about this, I, I would be. No, I, I just want on the record, okay. uh, you know, my concerns are legitimate. They're both operational. Uh, they, uh, I think there's some optic issues that we have to be aware of at a time when our city's really struggling. Yeah. And there's fiscal issues, which are actually real dollars and cents issues that I, I wanted to highlight if you're gonna make an amendment to this ordinance. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna lean on the city attorney and the uh, clerk to help me out here. I'd, I think I'd like to propose, or Commissioner Gonzalez, do you wanna propose the amendment? I'd be happy to and appreciate the opportunity. And Commissioner Maps, uh, I could use some help on the framing just to make sure I'm getting it correct but here. I think, I think we, we whittled it down a lot. Um, it would be traditional emergency language to allow this to be immediately put into effect to address firefighter staffing needs. Does that encapsulate why we're doing this? Y yes. Okay. I so move that. <laughs> Second. Second. Commissioner Gonzalez moves. Commissioner Maps seconds. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll on the amendment. Ryan. 
Thank you, Lindley. Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment's on the table. Any further discussion on the main motion is amended. And I did ask for public testimony, correct? And there was none? Right, there's no testimony. Very good. Testimony. Please call the roll on the main motion as amended. Ryan. Yes, um, I'm proud to support this agreement. Uh, thank you to, for the collaborative work that has gone into this. I've been hearing about it for about a year. And uh, thank you to the leadership of you, uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez, Chief Boone, President McLennan. Um, anyway, I. Gonzalez. I just want to reiterate my appreciation for Portland Fire, uh, Fire Union, Bureau of Human Resources, and their good work on this. Um, this is, alleviates a systemic issue, at least temporarily alleviates it. Um, and secondly, I appreciate the mayor's comments on the optics of it. I do want to remind folks that firefighters are working 24 hours on site. Uh, it is not comparable in many respects to what other um, city workers are uh, put through. Uh, particularly when that is stacked on top of each other, extended times away from home. It's just, it is not comparable to uh, other city workers in many respects. And so uh, appreciate the concerns about optics in a tight season, absolutely, but uh, supported BHR's recommendation here, uh, given the long history on it uh, and the unique nature of fire. Uh, with that, I vote aye. Rubio. No, sorry, maps. Aye. <laughs> Rubio. Um, I just want to appreciate uh, the conversation that took place today. I really appreciate the collaborative nature in which you entered into these discussions. I vote aye. Wheeler. I just can't help myself today, and I don't know why, but there are people sitting in the back of this chamber who would disagree that the Fire Bureau is alone in terms of working long shifts and being required to be from home. Same with our emergency management staff who've been called time and time again, often to work extensive multi-day shifts. So I, I just wanna be really careful when we're talking about our first responders. They're all important. And they all make significant sacrifices to serve the people of this city. And so that's why I really, um, I'm looking forward to us moving away from a commissioner style of government to a more collaborative enterprise-based approach so that we don't step on these kinds of landmines as we bring these types of issues forward. Uh, you've already heard my commentary on the package. I appreciate the work that was done to put the fiscal part of this together. It was a yeoman's effort in and of itself, and you all succeeded brilliantly, and I appreciate it. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted as amended. Thank you. Thank you. Next issue, a second reading, 267. Authorized competitive solicitation and purchase of an unmanned aircraft systems for use by Portland Police Bureau, not to exceed $80,000. Any further discussion on this item? Any questions? We have a lot of people here ready to pounce if we do. <laughs> Seeing none, this is a second reading. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I, I just want to say some things for the record. Um, I know that uh, drones can be, uh, bring concerns to people, um, especially, um, you know, right now we're getting, I want to acknowledge that and also want to provide some important assurances for the public who have reached out a lot uh, with concerns. Um, we passed earlier this year the new privacy and surveillance policy, and prior to that passage, PPV proactively worked with BP BTS to undergo uh, a review in order to be in alignment. And based um, on uh, this work, um, there were some identified um, areas and impacts to provide mitigating strategies um, that this program will adhere to and that we'll be, we'll be in constant communication about adhering to. Notable ones include specific trainings to staff and operators on civil liberties and civil rights, identifying no-fly zones and highly sensitive areas like churches, temples, schools, hospitals, and collecting demographic anonymized information for equity assessments. Um, and you know we will be paying careful attention so that this technology will be used uh, for its intended purposes and outlined in the SOPs. Um, but on balance, I support this technology because it can be very useful for working at crash scenes and other high, highly risky life and safety uh, situations. So I wanna appreciate PPV officers and smart city uh, policy staff for working together um, and also working to answer all our questions 
Um, and I'm also asking um, that the work continues to ensure the implementation is operating within the new policy parameters as it's rolled out and that we uh, receive transparent updates on its uses to the public. Happy to vote aye. Wheeler. So we heard a great presentation from Sergeants Dufresne and Sweeney. And I felt they made a very, very compelling argument. Uh, the lack of significant community testimony, I think, spoke to the good work that you did in terms of making the case, not only here to this council internally, but externally to the public. This is a very smart decision, and I really appreciate you bringing it forward. I'm very happy to vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks, all of you, for your service to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, 268, please. This is a non-emergency ordinance. Approve findings to authorize an exemption to the competitive bidding requirements and approve use of the alternative contracting method of progressive design build for the Inverness Force Main System Replacement Project. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. This ordinance authorizes environmental services and the procurement office to use an alternative competitive solicitation process to find a contractor to repair BES's Inverness Force Main System. The Inverness Force Main System is a 13 mile long pipe that carries wastewater through East Portland. This pipe serves about 12% of the city and is at risk of failing. A break in the force main would risk a large-scale sewage spill into the Columbia Slough, and that would represent a serious threat to the environment and human health. Because of those risks, repairing this infrastructure is among environmental services' highest priorities. Here uh, to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Marielle gesa Toivel, an engineering manager with environmental services, and I thought we were going to have Biko. Is Biko, are you participating in this one? All right, wait, <laughs> your choice. Uh, we always feel your we always feel your support so at this maybe point. It's now we've lost our audience. I uh, know <laughs> this is true. Well, I'm sure people are watching at home at this point in the uh, in the afternoon. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to turn this presentation over to staff. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. For the record, I am Muriel Gesa Teufel, engineering manager in the project management office of BES and. As Commissioner Mapp stated, it's the top three. This project is top three uh, highest priority project for BES of all the facilities that we have to take care of. So it's a significant project. Um, because of the risks, uh, it requires risks of implementation and the risks it presents if unaddressed. Um, it forces us to explore alternative delivery contracting methods. So Rhonda here is also in the PMO, uh, and she is the project manager, and she will go through the details uh, of the request today. Thanks, uh, good afternoon, and Keelan, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the presentation, perfect, and um, it can be advanced to the next slide, I imagine. Uh, for the record, I am Rhonda Fast, I'm a capital project manager at BES um, for the Inverness Forest Main Project, and Today, I'm gonna to cover some background information, uh, describe why we are seeking an exemption to low bid uh, procurement and instead um, seeking alternative delivery and give you some budget sorry, and schedule Keelan, information. Are we having problems with yeah, the presentation? Yeah, we are, we're, we're troubleshooting right now. Can you just sorry. pause for one okay. sec till we get sure. that ironed out? Thank you. There it is, Perfect. great. Thank you. Sorry. Excellent, and yeah, great. So today I'm just gonna quick overview of what we're talking about today, some background, why we're seeking the exemption, budget schedule, and then lastly, a recommendation. Next slide, please. Um, the Inverness pump station, which is shown on the far right of your screen, is nestled in an industrial area of outer northeast Portland, near 122nd and the Columbia Slough. The pump station with a 22 million gallon per day capacity receives sanitary flows, as Commissioner Maps mentioned, from 12% 12, 12 of the city. It includes major landmarks, including uh, Portland International Airport and some of the city's most vulnerable residential populations. Now, from that pump station, a 10 and a half mile long 
36-inch pressurized force main pipe conveys wastewater from that very large service area to the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant. And this is the connection that I'm talking about today. Because, if you could advance, in the last 10 years, a number of breaks has raised concern and priority level of this critical asset. We've had an increasing number of failures in the last few years, totaling near uh, over $6 million in emergency repairs just since 2020. And the condition of the pipe is largely unknown. Performing a condition assessment on a pipe of this size while maintaining service, critical service, is very, very complicated. But we do know, as Commissioner Maps mentioned, that the consequences of failure is very severe with both local impacts, potentially, and Columbia SLU impacts, um, as well as impacts for, on services for thousands. So therefore, the criticality of this service is what I want to highlight today. And we have an immediate need to reduce risks in the system and meet the objective of the project. Next slide, please which is to provide reliable service between the Inverness Pump Station and the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant. And to complete this work, we anticipate three, potentially three phases uh, to the project. First, a condition assessment, which includes a plan for bypass pumping, service outage constraints, and an alternatives analysis that would confirm the scope, schedule, and budget of the project. And then with that condition information, we can move with, with more certainty towards design and construction. And with this progression of work in mind for the project, we worked with procurement and city attorney's office, and it became clear that alternative delivery was a very good fit for this project. So next slide. Uh, we developed factual findings based on some of the criteria listed here from ORS um, and described in more detail in your ordinance package, Exhibit A. Um, and in the findings, we discuss why uh, progressive design build, in this case, if you could go to the next slide, um, is our preferred method. And with alternative delivery general, in general, we can select a team um, based on qualifications through a competitive RFP process. And also with progressive design build, we get early collaboration with an integrated contractor and designer team, um, which is a key benefit as well as ownership over all of the phases of the work, which is a particularly attractive feature that you don't get with low bid. And then uh, with that integrated team, we can collaboratively negotiate a, a guaranteed maximum price for the project with risks, reflecting the risks and means and methods to be used before construction begins. And then lastly, and this element is not part of the ORS criteria, but we feel is a key benefit for the city is that using alternative delivery, we will incorporate the requirements of the newer RWEA, the Work Regional Workforce Equity Agreement, and the construction diversity and inclusion policy into the project. Um, um, and given the unknowns that we have right now, that's a, um, a, an important feature that we want to highlight here. And it, the program does many things, including supporting wealth building opportunities for people of color and women and creating safe and anti-racist workspaces and much, much more. Next slide, please. And again, more detail on the criteria list in your ordinance package. But regarding the project budget and schedule, we are in the very early phases of the project, and there are many, many unknowns at this point that are dependent on collaboration. But given what we know now, um, we expect the total contract amount but to, be, to be between 38 and 69 million, with overall project costs in the 55 to 100 million dollar range. I acknowledge that's a wide range, but one that reflects the level of certainty that we know now at this very early stage. And then depending on the approved scope of the project, we anticipate to be complete by 2027. And then pending approval today, the next steps would be to go out with that RFP, that competitive RFP, um, select a contractor team, and then prior to the award of the first contract, we would be back with a report to council with updated project information, and then again at each subsequent amendment. Um, next slide. So with that, Muriel and I are um, happy to answer any questions, but we're recommending that you accept the factual findings and authorize an exemption from competitive low bid procurement for this project. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Any questions at this point? Any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right, great, uh, excellent presentation, and I, I personally appreciate the photographs because I really would not have understood what you were talking about if I couldn't see it, so thank you. That was extremely helpful. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item, please, 269.
and this is a also a non-emergency ordinance. Authorize competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Selwood Sanitary Sewer Extension Project for an estimated amount of $7,400,000. Commissioner Maps. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. This, ordinances, this ordinance authorizes the Chief Procurement Officer to conduct a competitive solicitation process for the lowest responsive bid to extend sewer services in Portland's Selwood neighborhood. Now, here's some background on this project. Environmental Services is working to provide direct sewer connections to 153 properties and build 7,200 feet of new sewer pipe in Portland's Selwood neighborhood. This project serves properties that do not have direct independent sewer connections to the city sewer system and do not meet city code. These are called non-conforming sewers. Here's why this project is important. Many of these non-conforming sewers are aging and some are failing. By providing direct sewer service to these properties, uh, this project will reduce the risk of broken pipes and sewage releases on both public and private property, which in turn will protect public health and people's property and the environment. This project is projected, projected to cost about $7.4 million. The work is scheduled to begin in September and will be completed within two years. Here today with a brief presentation, we have Melanie Wanlotunya, a supervising engineer with environmental services. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Can um, everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. And can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So again, my name is Melanie Palatunia. I am the Nonconforming Sewer Program Manager at the Bureau of Environmental Services. I'm just going to give you a short presentation kind of explaining the project in a little bit more detail. So, all right. So as Commissioner Mapp said, um, we're working in the Selwood neighborhood. We are, are planning to build approximately 7,200 feet of new sewer pipes. Um, most of the sewer pipes, um, well, most of the streets that we're showing here in our map are currently used, uh, utilizing what we call private lines in the right of way, meaning that sewer lines are private, they're running down the street, property owners are currently responsible for the entire length of those sewers. So what we want to do is bring public sewer to the properties so that um, property owners are able to reduce their future costs of um, maintenance and also just have a direct connection to the sewer. Um, we anticipate serving up to 153 properties on and hopefully getting rid of every private sewer line in the Selwood neighborhood for now. Um, we also will be upgrading one intersection with ADA ramps, um, and that's in collaboration with PBOT. Um, the construction itself should be very straightforward. We're using open trench excavation. There will be a few um, spots where we are using a trenchless lateral installation to avoid trees, but for the most part, um, typical straightforward construction for sewer. Um, the biggest part of this project really for us was the public outreach. Um, you know, every BES project has a general public outreach where we are notifying people of upcoming projects. Um, but in addition to that, we did extensive work with each of the individual property owners that's going to be impacted. Um, as you can see in this map, um, what we'll do is send out a map to each property owner who's receiving sewer. We give them an opportunity to comment on it. We have a staff that is devoted entirely to um, working directly with the property owner, answering questions. Um, we also pay for property owners to have sewer scopes so that we can provide them with the best product that works for their property. Um, our general PI outreach was done by JLA Public Involvement, which is a woman owned company. And we plan on continuing to use them throughout the construction um, process as well. We did conduct a few community workshops and canvassing the neighborhood type work um, and continue to do so. And our, our staff member who is um, committed to working with property owners continues to be available throughout the construction project process as well. Um, you know, the, the biggest impact to the community besides you know, receiving sewer services is that we do um, per code have to charge a fee. So um, once we're done with the project, 
property owners have 180 days to connect. There are a few septic properties in this project and they have three years. Um, most of the properties are residential properties here and the fee for that is $8,400. That's a, a very subsidized fee. Um, if, if property owners had to build the sewer extensions on their own, it would be more in the hundred to $200,000 level. So this is, um, it's, is, a, is a good price. It's still money though. So we do um, offer financial assistance program. People can apply for loans through BES. We have deferral programs, um, low interest loans, and we have a whole another department devoted to that. Uh, commercial properties, there are a few of them in this project. They will, they get charged differently. It's dependent on the size of the property. Um, and we also do offer loans for them as well. So just to sum up, um, the costs, we're anticipating it coming in in around the $7,400,000 seven price range, um, hoping to advertise this summer and begin construction in September. Um, it's a fairly large project, so we're thinking it'll take approximately two years to construct um, throughout the neighborhood. And that's it. Any questions? Very good. Colleagues? Do we have public testimony on this? No one item? signed up. All right. This is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you for the presentation. We appreciate it, Melanie. Next item is 270. This is a second reading. Authorized competitive solicitation and execution of price agreements for on-call stormwater improvement services to support the Bureau of Environmental Services private property retrofit program for $3 million over five years. Colleagues, any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 257 from the consent agenda. Authorized five-year lease extension for office, parking, and storage space at 810 North Graham Street for an estimated annual cost of $212,733. Colleagues, before we discuss this item, I am moved to amend the ordinance title to correct the annual cost to $259,747. Do I have a second? Second. I motion Commissioner Mapp seconds. Please call the roll on the amendment to correct the ordinance <coughs> title. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance has been adopted. The Portland Bureau, or excuse me, the amendment has been adopted. The Portland Bureau of Transportation leases approximately 1.1 acres of office storage and parking space at 810 North Graham, commonly known as the Graham Garage. The OMF Facilities Planning and Portfolio Management team are assisting PBOT with a five-year extension for this site. We have Real Property Officer Pauline Goebel and Real Estate Portfolio Manager Rick Dyer from OMF Facilities, as well as PBOT's Business Operations Supervisor Mary Beth Elmes here to present the item. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. We're actually here to answer any questions that you may have regarding this um, lease extension. Very good. Colleagues, any... Keely? Oh, no, sorry. Colleagues, any discussion on this item? I'm just curious who pulled this. Uh, we did. We had to correct the title. Oh, okay. I, got it. I, right. I believe there was someone from the public that did uh, pull this, actually. Oh, okay. And, ahead of time. and we had to correct the title. Okay, <laughs> oh, that's convenient, and, good. Two birds, yeah, thank you very much, time. yes. <laughs> Pauline, thank you. And, but we don't have anybody signed up to testify on this. Either. No, it was a member of the public who pulled it initially, but they are they did not show up today. Okay, well, they, okay. they probably caught our error and were wise to pull it. So that's great. There you go. So if you're out well, there, uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> this is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Ryan. Hi. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Also from the uh, consent agenda item 258, please. Pay settlement of Matthew Lovato and Stacy Carmen personal injury lawsuit for $15,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a suit brought against the city back in February of 2022. Deputy City Attorney Dan Simon and Senior Claims Analyst David Farrow are here to walk us through the ordinance. Welcome, Dan and David. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. 
This lawsuit arises out of PPB's role in the alleged wrongful eviction of plaintiffs from a Motel 6 in North Portland on February 19, 2021. PPB officers responded to a 911 call from the Motel 6 manager for assistance in removing two guests from the motel. The three responding PPB officers handled the situation professionally and consistent with similar hotel or motel trespass calls and resolved the situation peacefully. Plaintiffs then later alleged that they had established tenancy at the motel under Oregon's landlord tenant law, entitling them to the protection of the eviction process and therefore they should have received an advanced eviction notice from the motel. The city attorney's office and risk management determined that if plaintiffs prove tenancy, additional facts may expose the city to liability for wrongful eviction, such as Ms. Carmon's claim that she told police that the plaintiffs had lived at the motel for six months, the large amount of personal belongings in their room, the potential coercive effect of the officer's reference to possible arrest, and the lack of landlord tenant law training at PPB. The plaintiffs testified to the unpleasant and difficult residential circumstances that followed their departure from the Motel 6, which included some financial losses and disruption of their family living arrangements. The city also faced the possibility of a paying, paying attorney fees if it was found liable. The parties negotiated formally and agreed upon a settlement to which the city of Portland will contribute $15,000 in total to plaintiffs, inclusive of all attorney fees and outstanding liens or costs to resolve this claim. Um, why don't we hear from Mark, and I'll see if I have any right, questions. We have one person signed up, Mark, is that correct? That's Mark All right, good. Mark Porras, you're up. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have no objection to the city paying $15,000 to settle this lawsuit, and we fully understand the parties have agreed to the terms of the settlement. Uh, we pulled this item from the consent agenda to give you the opportunity to discuss Portland Police Bureau's policy again causing taxpayer seems uh, to be that the police have poor training and no clear policy regarding enforcing landlord tenant disputes um, the lawsuit was filed by plaintiffs mr lovato and his sister ms carmen who along with ms carmen's four young children had been long-term residents at the motel six in north portland and the Motel 6 general manager called 911, asked for police assistance, as we heard from Mr. Simon, in removing the six residents from the property. Uh, PPB officers Emily Coat, John Shadron, and Chris Culp re responded to the call, ordered the tenants to leave under threat of arrest. Um, and, uh, excuse me, where am I? Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, and told them that they could have one hour to gather their belongings. What we understand from the court documents is that Oregon law provides for people who live at a hotel for over 30 days to enjoy the same rights as tenants. This means the motel owner needed to provide advance notice of eviction to get a court order before calling the police. And the plaintiff said police officers routinely arrive at motels to remove unwanted persons without conducting any investigation into whether they have been residing there long enough to be protected by the law. The plaintiffs also claim it is the practice and custom of the city of Portland when police officers are summoned to a hotel to remove a guest that the officer will conduct no investigation into the length of a guest's stay and to assume that um, hotel staff call police to remove a guest only when they have not stayed there long enough to become a tenant. Uh, Judge Beckerman stated that the court found the plaintiffs had adequately pleaded claims against the city based on both a policy custom or practice and a failure to train. This is known as a Monell claim. Uh, the impact statement says that the total cost to the city to settle the lawsuits $15,000, which by now we all know is a blatant misrepresentation of the facts. There are at least 51 documents filed in this lawsuit, uh, many of them mentioning city attorney Mr. Simon. Um, how many hours did he spend on this case? What did that cost? How much time did Mr. Farrow, the liability claims analyst, spend on this case? For the sake of transparency, every settlement should include the amount of time and money spent by city employees so the public can understand the true cost of misconduct and in this case, inadequate policies. You also have an opportunity right now to tell the public how you are going to fix this problem. Will this be the last time a long-term tenant is illegally evicted from a motel with PPB's assistance? Will you ensure that adequate training around landlord tenant laws provided to the gun carrying city employees who currently take motel operators word when they are asked to trespass law abiding people from their property? Again, taking the time as you settle these claims to examine the underlying causes for them will provide future protection for community members, police officers, and the city. Thank you, and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you. 
Um, so, Dan, you may not know the answer to this question, but has this resulted in a change in training? Not currently uh, that I'm aware of, Mr. Mayor. Certainly, you know, this is an issue where we will be in contact with the advice attorneys at the city attorney's office and figure out the plan moving forward. Yeah, and, and this, this is a particularly thorny one uh, from my perspective. And, and first of all, let me just say I'm really grateful that the city and the plaintiffs were able to reach a compromise settlement here. I think that's entirely appropriate. I'm really appreciative of it. But it also does raise a really complex issue that our police officers, our frontline officers have to resolve. This is just one of many different types of examples where police are called into a particular type of situation and it requires on the spot investigative follow-up before further action is taken. And so I, I want to acknowledge that this isn't cut and dry. This is not easy for our frontline officers when they show up at a scene and they have to adjudicate this. They have to investigate it. They have to make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before they take the next steps. But on the other hand, as the plaintiffs have indicated and as Judge Beckerman has indicated, uh, the law is the law. And our frontline officers do have to comport with the law and the tenancy uh, uh, ordinances or uh, statutes that are on the book. So I, I look forward to following this and uh, seeing how we can both help people in the community who have reached their residency requirement as well as our officers who are entitled, I think, for us to give them appropriate information and training so that they know how to adjudicate these types of circumstances. Any other comments or questions on this, Commissioner Maps? Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you for uh, um, that dialogue right here. Um, I'm glad you're going to lean into this a little bit. I, the outcomes here strike me as being a little bit counterintuitive in, in some ways. I'd, I'd love to learn more, um, and I trust that the commissioner in charge of public safety and the police will work to bring some clarity to this policy space and to my understanding of issues like this. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or discussions? Mark, thanks for your testimony. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is has adopted and we're done, right? We're done. And we're adjourned for the morning. Thank you.